Good evening, Smithtown, and thank you for joining us tonight. On this National Flag Day, would everybody please stand for the pledge in a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I just have to say, this is always the best time of the year. As uh, school year finishes up, you're able to see all the different accomplishments across all the buildings, uh, the seniors, their excitement for what's to come and the pride of what they've accomplished. And uh, just there's, there's so many great things going on throughout the district. I hope um, we're doing a good job highlighting those things, and I hope that you're able to see not just you know what's happening at the building maybe your kids attend or where you live, but across the district because... You know, as we've had presented here throughout the last several months uh, with, with our, our different athletes, and, uh, not athletes, but student athletes, and um, different clubs, it's just, there's so many talented students and, and great accomplishments that um, we really want to try to highlight and recognize those as, as much as possible. We have another, uh, the robotics team, which I'm excited about later on. We, we'll get a chance to see them. And I don't know if you were at Smithtown Day, uh, but they were there with, with their booth and... Um, able to speak about what they've done and what they do and how they compete. And uh, they were telling my little younger guys about Legos and, and how they can get involved in um, you know, the robotics later on down the road. And it was just um, such a wide variety of, of, um, of opportunities and possibilities, and it, it really is great to see. So I hope you guys are excited as I am to see all the things that are, are happening. Anybody else going to share anything? Dr. Secor, please. Yeah, please. Right on cue. <laughs> Good evening, uh, and, and thank you, Mr. Gribben. And we, we have some acknowledgments that we would like to share with the Board of Education and school community this evening. Tonight, we would like, like to recognize some of our outstanding robotics and DECA students. And I will ask Christine LaFries, our Director of Career and Technical Education, to come up and introduce them. And shortly after that, there will be a brief, awesome demonstration of our robot. Yeah, no, it always is impressive. Thank you, Dr. Secor. I'm going to ask Mr. Hennings, Mrs. Massimo, Mrs. Wood to come up here with me as well. They are the uh, DECA advisors. We're going to recognize the DECA um, international competitors. Um, just to let you know what they had to do to get here, um, DECA is a co-curricular club at both high schools, and it's for students involved in our business program. And it's all done outside of their classroom day. Um, they spend a lot of time preparing, working on their manuals, working on their presentations. We have great mentors from the community that come out and work with them. And this year, we were fortunate to have a selection of students that made it to our international competition in Atlanta, Georgia. Every year, it's somewhere else. We've been to California. We've been to Florida. We've been to Utah. Um, and you know, it was a little challenging this year. They, they did virtual for um, regionals and states, um, but they still rose to the top. They were in the top three in the state in order to qualify to make it to nationals. So we're really, really proud of the hard work and dedication, and I thank the advisors also for their hard work and dedication that they put in. So I will call up your name, and you guys can come up. Uh, Michael Fallon for Professional Selling, Hospitality, and Tourism from High School East. Allison Tewill did Professional Selling from High School East. Juliana Nestor, Principals of Hospitality and Tourism from High School East. And we also had Antonio Sabatino, but he could not be with us tonight from High School East. And now from High School West, we have Sean Carroll. Abby Portella. And Katie McGee. They did a sales project manual. So they actually wrote a manual and did a presentation in front of judges. And they created and marketed and sold High School West uh, apparel. So that was their project. Um, Hitim Hussani, Principals of Hospitality and Tourism. <laughs> Juliana Reuter, Apparel and Accessories Marketing. Uh, Julia, sorry. <laughs> and Matthew Braun, Personal Financial Literacy from High School West. So congratulations to all the competitors.
Thank you. Okay, next up, we're gonna move on to robotics. We have a couple of recognitions before I turn it over to the team to do their um, demo. I'm gonna ask Mr. Savage and Mr. Costello to come up so they can hand out their certificates. They are the robotics team advisors. So our first award goes to John Galetta. Come on up, John. And John was a Dean's List semi-finalist, uh, was the award he won. In an effort to recognize the leadership and dedication of the most outstanding secondary school students from first, the Cayman family sponsors awards for selected 10th or 11th grade students, known as the First Dean's List Award. The students who earn First Dean's List status as a semifinalist are great examples of current student leaders who have led their teams and communities to increase awareness for FIRST and its mission while achieving personal technical expertise and accomplishment. This is a very high honor for someone to receive. So we are very proud of John from High School West for receiving this and he helped get the team be able to go to uh, their international competition in, where were we, Dallas? Houston, Houston, Texas. So congratulations, John. I'm gonna ask you to stay, John. Because now we're going to recognize the entire team, uh, some members of the team, for receiving their Excellence in Engineering Award. So I'd like to call up Abigail Brennan, Akib Syed, Christiana Felcaro, Luke Clark, and Varshita Cadella. And the Excellence in Engineering Award celebrates the team that demonstrates a professional approach to the design process. A team must be able to describe the engineering process they went through and can trace elements of the designs from conception. The designs reflect an engineering solution to a specific problem and its functional practice. The designs are elegant and advantageous on the field of play. So congratulations to the team for receiving that award. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Savage and Mr. Costello because we'll have a little demo of the robot. Hello everybody, my name is uh, David Savage. I'm a technology teacher at High School East and a co-advisor of the robotics team for about seven years now. My name is Brian Costello. I'm a technology teacher at High School West for the last two years and I'm the co-advisor of the robotics team. We have two other gentlemen here. This is Matthew Quigley. He's one of the assistant advisors and Brian Sheridan, who's also an assistant advisor. They're both also former presidents of the team um, and uh, Smithtown graduates. And I'm gonna pass it over to Matt Quigley, who's gonna talk a little bit about how the team leads straight into college, career, and industry. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I graduated the team in 07, but before that I spent four years on the robotics team here. And um, the skills that these uh, students will learn, well, they'll take with them for the rest of their lives. Things like time management, cost management, the ability to work on complex problems that don't have finite solutions. You know, not every answer is in the back of a textbook. Um, and things like working with people. You know, as the complexity increases, um, the stress increases, and people start arguing, and I actually love that. Because it means that they really care about it, and, and they're gonna focus hard and, and really try to do what's best for the team. And these skills are brought into college. You know, um, I graduated from my master's and bachelor's of mechanical engineering from Stony Brook. And um, for five years, I would sit in classrooms, and you can tell the students that went from a first program. They were the ones a little bit more focused, a little more able to handle the dearth of the knowledge that's being brought to you, um, and just a little bit more grounded. Um, and that goes not only to college, also to industry. Um, freshman year of high school, I uh, was so excited to be on a field trip. We went to a German automation company called Festo. And uh, we learned about pneumatics, so air-powered air cylinders. And nine years later, I'm at a job fair and, uh, from college. And I saw Festo, just wanted to go say hi. And um, that led to my career. And um, I've been with this company for 10 years. And um, you know, I'm in a small group of five people, and four of them came from this program. And frankly, the fifth person didn't come here because he was in an industry way before this was even a program. But um, it, it really does help you succeed in life. And that's something that the uh, students are probably um, definitely fortunate, but probably not really recognizing how fortunate they are. Um, very last thing I'd like to say is just thank you. Thank you to the board members. Thank you to the community. Thank you to the administrators. Um, because the students really are lucky. 
Um, I've seen programs not start because of the uh, financial and time commitments that something like this takes. Um, us mentors spend hundreds of hours preparing and leading the students through what they need to do in a given year. And if you don't think it takes that long, just ask my wife because she reminds me very often about that fact. Um, and there are programs that don't start because of those uh, responsibilities or those requirements. There are programs that fold right away because of how hard it is. And this really is a community event and the students are very lucky to be here. And the very last thing is that this robot is uh, prototyped, designed, built, tested, and competed with by the students. We advise them, you know, we teach them, we get on their nerves, and those are my three core responsibilities. So everything that they're about to show you comes from them directly. And uh, that's all that I got. So uh, thank you for, my, for your time. OK, so Christiana told me not to talk anymore. So I'm just going to hand it off to them because it's a student-run team. So as you know, we are the Smithtown Robotics team. So we are comprised of both High School East and High School West. So as Mr. Quigley was saying, everything is built, programmed, competed with, all by students. So we meet um, almost every day. I'll talk about more later about how often we really do, because it is a lot. Um, so yeah, I'll bring you guys into the presentation. So I'll start by introducing. I'm Christiana Falacaro. I am a senior. I'm the Vice President of Business. I'm uh, John Gleda. I'm a junior, and I'm the incoming president of the team. I'm Abigail Brennan. I'm a freshman, and I'm the ambassador for the middle school FOL teams. I'm Vishita Kodella, and I'm a junior, and I'm the public relation officer for next year. Uh, hi, my name is Luke Clark. I am a junior and also head of competitions for next year. Hey everyone, my name is Akib Said, and I'm the vice president of engineering for this year. So we want to start off by talking a bit about the program in which we operate, which is called FIRST, uh, stands for, for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. And they're a global organization operating in uh, uh, hundreds, um, over 100 countries on the planet Earth. Uh, especially now they're having a big boom in Turkey and in Israel. And it's really phenomenal. We get to meet all these people and uh, spread the love of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, not just in our local community, not even in our state and national community, but in a global community now. Um, and in, now, first, um, stands, they're, they're doing two primary things. One is uh, providing a, a way for students to love and become inspired by and delve their way into STEM, um, providing them with career opportunities and paths into college that will be spoken about later. But um, it's also uh, providing a sort of sport-like, I say in quotes, scenario uh, where uh, there's a very competitive aspect. Many of us, uh, we don't take part in the, uh, the athletic sports, but this allows us to dive our, uh, our passions into it. And um, it sort of it fulfills a very uh, competitive role for the, the, at the high school level. Uh, it's, as you'll see, um, there's over 80 million in scholarships that's provided through FIRST. And um, it opens up tons of doors into the future. In, not only in STEM, but in other fields that will be impacted by the various skills that you'll see we learn on this team. Now I'm going to hand it off to Abigail Brennan now. She's going to talk about engineering skills. <laughs> um, so on the team, we go through our first steps of the design process where we learn how to prototype and draft. And then we go into the actual building of the robot where we learn how to program we learn electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and just problem solving in general, because we do um, experience some bumps along the way. And then, well, then let's get on to the business department of our team. So we, so the business department handles all these sponsorships and outreach programs where students can develop their financial management skills, their organization skills, 
their uh, professional communication skills with corporate sponsors uh, from companies such as Festo, Altis, Microsoft, and local companies too. So we do outreach programs such as like um, the Smithtown Elementary presentations that we did, and the Smithtown Fair that Mr. Griffin, uh, that Mr. Griffin talked about earlier, and uh, yeah, and then we do like. Um, so we do like different um, outreach programs and then we do go, go into like developing our photography skills and videography skills and like social media. And yeah, that's like one of our big skills that we learn on our business department, on our team. So I'll bring this to Luke Clark. Now, all these um, actions and stuff that we do throughout the season um, is not just to build a robot, but it is also to make life skills. Uh, leadership, communication, uh, something that can be expressed via business uh, communication, uh, getting sponsorships and all that, um, where we're talking to real companies, uh, getting money, um, or you know, teamwork, leadership, all these which are usually found in sports, but are just as easily found here in our robotics team. Um, there's also adaptivity um, and being able to work under pressure, which is very important in the modern world, I would have to assume. Um, and each of these work towards making a better person. Uh, I'll put on to my great friend here, Akiv Syed. Thank you, Luke. Um, you've heard about all the skills that robotics requires from the last three people that came before me. You've heard about the engineering skills that it requires. It requires mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, programming. You name the skill, we have the skill. We have business uh, with sponsorships. We have communication. Um, we have to fund the robot. This robot costs about like $5,000 to build. So we have to contact these companies. Um, and these skills that we learn all through our high school, these don't just stay in high school. These carry over to college. Um, we have sent, as a team, we've sent people to Harvard, to MIT, to Cornell. Um, and if I get to brag about myself a little bit, I'm going to the University of Maryland for a full ride. And uh, my friend here, Christiana, she's going to SUNY Oswego for technology education. So you can really begin to see just the impact that this community has on the seniors and on all people on the team. And I, I think I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just not speaking for myself when I say that this team has really helped me gain the skills necessary to have a successful future in technology and also in business. Um, and with that, I'll pass it off to Christiana. So I would like to talk about when we meet during the year. So we start really early, we start in September. From September to January, we meet every Thursday, about, about until 7.30 at night. And January, we have this thing called kickoff. So that's when they give us the game, um, all of the rules, all the constraints. We get a very long manual, about 300 pages, that you have to sit there and read. Um, and then from that point, from January to March, until the end of competitions, we're meeting every single day after school. So every single day after school with homework after, of course. But it is a lot of work, but it's so much fun put in. And we have team dinners every night in build season. So everybody is really connected on our team. So I would really like to thank the board for having us. Thank you. And now we're going to give you a little demonstration of what our robot does. So uh, once we enable here, we can talk about the sort of engineering process and the robot itself. Are we in? It's not blinking. I'll keep. All right, so yeah. <laughs> this is a robot, generally. <laughs> and so, uh, all right, so it's enabled now. There's a little light there that's a robot safety light, and it's got to demonstrate that the, robo uh, that the robot is enabled, and that means that it can hurt you if you don't behave around it. So uh, the first part that uh, in, in the process of this building the robot, we have to identify a task, a use case, so to speak. Um, and that task is provided by first. And that is, in this case, we have to shoot a ball by intaking it from the ground and then launching it out into a, uh, a big conical hoop. So uh, I'll demonstrate now the intake is going to come down right now. And, uh, and now it's going to come back up. And it does that through a pneumatic system that's just right here. And um, Akib actually designed this with the other programmers. It comes down, it's, gonna, it's able to, we can take this out, or you can roll it in. It intakes the ball using these mechanism wheels that are able to funnel it in, which was a last minute engineering decision. 
So uh, gotta go for it. Look at how that works. That's really phenomenal. So yeah. Then moving on to the second primary component of our uh, robot is the feeding system, which went through quite a few iterations. Initially, we went for a, a thin cord, but now we had to adjust to a belt because it was uh, a lot less slippage was occurring on the pulleys, and it gave us more surface area. So, uh, as you can see, I don't know if you can see, but there's these orange belts right here, all over, all internally, and they're responsible for transporting the ball up over here. Now, uh, it's moving it back and forth. Very. Sick. Now, uh, we're going to try and launch one of these balls in a safe manner. Um, and as a matter of fact, it's not going to hurt anybody or any equipment, and it's going to be quite astonishing that that's the case. So uh, these wheels here, they, we had to calculate. We, uh, a kid named Leo spent about a week figuring out the ideal distance between these two wheels. Uh, very good engineering, good prototyping went into that, and he learned quite a bit. And uh, then we had to calculate the angle, and then after all that, we, put it, we were able to put it in CAD and then duplicate it in real life. So we're going to now demonstrate that it does that. Good job, Luke. What a guy. Miss LaFreese as well. Phenomenal. Thank you. Wow. That's... And I said we weren't athletic. Back. That's forward. That's forward. Forward is back on the robot. It's not a good, it doesn't make any sense. Go for it. Look at that. And they said we weren't athletic. So that's quite nice. Now, uh, this is the part that I talk about a lot, but I will not talk about it a lot now because Akib said so. And it's uh, this climber here. So we're going to actuate the climber to demonstrate what it's supposed to do. The robot does a pull up on a bar. It's rather fascinating. Um, and now it's, imagine there's a bar like right here, and you can like picture it, and then it's gonna, it comes, you pull it down, and then and these hooks actuate and it locks on, so it'll stall the motor. Very long uh, 2D design process went into that, as well as a three-dimensional design process on the computer. Um, and then it eventually failed, and we had to do it all over again. And that's what I talk about usually. But that's engineering, and that's how you learn on the team. We learn about failure and success, and that is, at the end of the day, the idea of this presentation that um, we're not, strictly speaking, well, we are a robotics team, strictly speaking, but it's not only a robotics team. As Dean Kamen, who's the founder of FIRST, says, it's more than robots. We're, using, uh, we're not using kids to build robots. They're using robots to build kids. And that, takes, that manifests in the engineering skills, but also in the business skills and the soft skills that we've spoken about in our presentation. Uh, we'd collectively like to thank the board and all of the, uh, the audience. Oh, wait, we have one more thing. Oh, no, you, you do? <laughs> All right. Get ready. This is not my idea. <laughs> and uh, now we'd like to thank the board extra for letting us uh, hopefully come back next year. So, hopefully there's no shooters next year in the game. Anyway, thank you. We're Team A-10. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you to the board for allowing them and Dr. Secor to come tonight. Um, they're an amazing group of students to work with. They put a lot of time in. Um, and I'm very grateful to have, be able to work with them. So thank you. It's, I have to say it's incredible to see the teamwork, passion, and camaraderie that you all uh, display. And uh, just the fact that that was built from scratch is, uh, is, is pretty impressive. So uh, I know a lot of you guys are thanking the board. Uh, we, we're just here representing the community. The community is the one that provides these opportunities. And like we said last time, those opportunities create futures. And uh, it's great to see. And we wish you guys all the best in everything you do. Right. Like I said, a lot of great stuff going on in, in the district. 
So we have our, um, back to our agenda, we to move to receive the um, claim, claims auditor's report. We have a motion to approve the claims auditor's report. Motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Next, I'd like to see if we can get a motion to approve the minutes of the May 10th and May 24th regular meetings, the May public hearing, and the May 17th annual meeting. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. And finally, a motion to accept correspondence items 1 through 12. Motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Uh, moving on to unfinished business. Uh, Mr. Savaretti, do you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, um, I went to, I had the honor of being asked by my daughter to be a chaperone at the Relay for Life, which I knew nothing about. I gave her permission to do it like a parent would, made my donation. Um, I had the honor of being there from 4.30 in the afternoon to 5 o'clock in the morning so I could chaperone her team. The, what those kids did, we talk about team, the athletes, we talk about clubs. These kids raised over $70,000 for cancer research. Now, for me, it was, it, it's, it felt for me because I'm a cancer survivor. And I had a lot of those girls who were there who are my daughter's friends were on my softball team. I never told them I had cancer. I told them, a friend of mine who I coached with told me, make it that you lost the bet and you had to shave your head. Because it was their last year and I wanted them to enjoy it. I didn't want them to worry about me. Um, and they were fantastic players, they won the champion. But seeing them watching me walk around as a survivor, they finally realized what I had. Just what those kids did to me, I, I took it like personal because $70,000, if anybody's listening to me, next year if we could all maybe everybody go out there and support them because they were selling things on the field, um, they were raising money up and sending apps out to everybody, let's try to break that record because that is something, $70,000 for high school kids to raise for cancer research, it, it's, they deserve a round of applause, that was very great. Yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing that. I think that's awesome that they were able to do that. I also think we need to, especially with fundraising opportunities, and find a mechanism for kids that are coming from families that can't necessarily find that money and having a way that they can quietly reach out so maybe they can't do the financial donation, you know, but kids that want to be a part of it, don't have the means to be a part of it, can still be a part of it without any any blemish because they didn't have the money. I think it's awesome. And I just know that for some kids, uh, I think the, the sentiment of what we do is amazing. I think the, the money that our kids raise is amazing. And I'm, I'm envious that you had an opportunity to do that with your child and your friends and stuff like that. But going forward to continue to build on that success, also finding a mechanism for kids that just don't have the means to participate, and that's not on you, John, or taking anything away. Just want to have as many kids that want to be there, find a way to be there, and that's something that, Dr. Sikor, if we can talk with our high school administration about finding a, a confidential conduit for kids to reach out and say, I want to be there, I just don't have those funds. Yeah, but it wasn't individual fundraising. They did it as a group. Right. My daughter had a group of, I believe, seven kids, boys and girls. Other groups had more. They did it as a group, as a team, and then they just pulled it all together. Right. And that $70,000 was everyone together as a school dish. I believe it was just Smithtown West. Again, I apologize, I'm not 100% sure. But they did it together. It wasn't an individual. It, each team did it oh. so that it gets some. I, I, mean, I know you don't, just let you know that yeah. I don't think income a thing, but I agree everybody should I, have the right to participate. Right. In that. I just, I know that we have a that there's been a, a minimum f to get in or, or kids aren't gonna share that their family don't have the, doesn't have the means to do it. But uh, 
you know, just to see as many kids as we can get out there to be there and walk and, and celebrate, you know, uh, this momentous, you know, celebration of people getting healthy. I'm sure right. it's amazing. I think you both raised wonderful points. You know, there's fundraising is incredibly important, but so is awareness and engagement, and we want to make sure all of our students have that opportunity. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Any other unfinished business items? Uh, yes, Matt, I do. Um, so I have a motion to make, and I would just like to preface it. Um, the last meeting we had, I made a motion which was tabled. Uh, there were a lot of questions about it. So I made another motion that's a little bit more specific. I agreed to table my motion um, under the condition that we were going to have a meeting for the instructional committee to move forward. And it's been three weeks that meeting hasn't happened. Um, so with that said, because I would really like to get the ball rolling on our um, enrichment program, I'd like to make a motion to the superintendent of schools uh, that he provide the board with the cost to reinstate our elementary enrichment program as it was at the time of its cancellation in today's dollars by June 28, 2022's board meeting. Do we have a motion? That's my motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? So I know that we had a, a quite a lengthy discussion about this last time, and I know that as far as enrichment programs go, I, I, there's so many possibilities of, of what the district would be able to provide, and I, I believe that's why it was decided to table that motion to have the discussion in Instructional Review Committee. Um, were you able to conduct the Instructional Review Committee? No, we weren't. And okay. that's the, and again, the reason I agreed to table the motion was because we were going to have a meeting to talk about more specifics about it. Uh, that didn't happen, so that's why I made my motion very specific to the program that was in existence. And again, it's just a, a jumping off point to get the ball rolling. As, as you all know, I feel very, very strongly about an enrichment program you, in the district. Um, what, what, at about what time did that previous enrichment program stop? I, I, off the top of my head, I, I, I believe it was 2012. The cost at okay. the time was about $70,000. It, it, it makes me think that 10 years has passed since that program has ceased. I think that there's probably, you know, obviously different people in different leadership roles, whether it be definitely superintendent, cabinet, directors. I think that discussion should be had where you have our, our academic leaders talk about possibilities of probably a much better program than what was there 10 years ago in, in providing different opportunities for our kids. I think that it's vital to have those discussions before sending uh, Mr. Tobin and, and his staff to start putting numbers together for something that might not even be worthwhile because there's other things that, that are better. Absolutely, a discussion has to be made, um, has to be had. Um, and again, I was told we could start a discussion and it's been three weeks and we don't even have a date set. Is have, there a reason uh, why there's been no it, date it, So the discussion was more, if we were looking at the instructional committee, that would be myself, Karen, uh, uh, Kevin, and the three of us would be on there, whoever else. We were looking to get, when the last conversation that we had here at the board meeting, looking to get teacher input, building administration input, so we can bring people together as this is, you know, an idea that's coming from the board and looking to get input from the administration and buildings, teachers, to see what type of program in 2022, 23 would be more applicable to something that we were doing, you know, over a decade ago. I also believe, and again, I don't have the figures in front of me, but if there were just two teachers running the enrichment program, and I think in its final stages that was there, it was certainly a lot more than 70,000, just, you know, salary and benefits alone, you know, would probably be triple that cost. Uh, I'm all for a really good in-depth conversation. I know that's going to be our a topic of priority for the instructional meeting come September, but the reason why we didn't have a meeting is just finding a mutual date where everybody was available. You know, and I had shared, I don't know about anybody else, I, I work in a school, I'm not home any night from last week through the remainder of this week, and, and then, you know, except for Monday for the holiday, I, I, I was not available to come. Uh, I was available on the 23rd, that was moving up. I was available the final week of June, uh, any day. Uh, our administrators are still here. Our teachers are not here. 
but it's important to bring everybody to the table. And this isn't pushing it off. It's, you know, we can do it two ways. We could do it fast or we could do it right. And I think having what we're looking for for 22, 23 and beyond, I think that's worthy of a, a discussion with all the different representation to be a part of it. And so I think and that conversation absolutely has to happen before we send our administrators off doing something that would wind up being completely meaningless. Um, that conversation needs to happen, and, and when it does, um, and it's not going to take one meeting, I'm sure, it's gonna, it's gonna be over months and months of, 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 uh, of time, um, those costs need to be set at that time. I, I think that just taking our, or, or requiring our administrators to go ahead and do work that will have no meaning in 2022 is a complete waste of, of, of time and money that should be spent uh, in more meaningful uh, areas right now. You know, and, and Mike, I, Mike, I do, I agree with what you're saying. It okay. could be done fast, it could be done right, right. Um, but it has to start. Right. right. If it doesn't start, well, it can't be done I fast, think, right, slow, wrong. Well, I think we talked about at not the previous meeting, but the meeting before that, that this would be a focal point, that we would not be looking to implement the program for the 22-23 school year, but it would be the following year giving us the next school year to collect the data, to get the input from administration, to get teacher input, to see what really is the best bang for our buck and what we're looking to do and come up with the consensus. Now, I know that we start the budget process, you know, January is really when we start getting work. They start gathering information in December, but I think having four months, five months of putting that together, and we can set up multiple meetings to get that input, and then ask driving questions. You know, what is our specific target audience? Are we looking at primary? Are we looking at intermediate? Are we looking at an after schools program? Are we looking for an in-school program? How are we getting equity among seven buildings that have a variety of sizes? So these are all conversations that you and I don't have the answers to, but we need the input from teachers and building administration how to make a quality program and equitable amongst the seven elementary schools. And that's going to take a lot of work, but I think that conversation could start in September because we weren't able to put it together. Not that anybody's running from it, it's just it wasn't enough time to get there. And like I said, I think in my personal opinion, having all the stakeholders there uh, I think we could put some really meaningful time set aside, set up a, a, uh, a string of meetings, you know, with those jumping points, and then we can go from there. I think the data of the cost and the program from 10 years ago is not going to be applicable to what we're looking to do for our kids today. Uh, our abilities have gone up exponentially of what our kids are able to do. You know, I remember back in the day they were building bridges with popsicle sticks and, and uh, toothpicks, and I think now our kids are working on coding and really that 21st generation type science standards that I think would be, you know, really the, the way we should be looking at to going forward. From what I understand, the, um, the program that was here 10 years ago, it was teachers um, just teaching before school. It wasn't a full-blown class where the teacher would have, it'd be a separate position. Is that correct? That's not, that's not correct. Well, can we find out what the program was before? Because I don't know what it was 10 years ago. I, I do. I, I, maybe not 10 years ago, but I could speak from it. From a teacher perspective, it was for, it was in the intermediate grades. Wait, this it was, was Smithtown you're talking in about? In Smithtown. Okay. Yeah, no. Elem that, it was that, elementary. It was elementary. elementary. It was at a Compton Elementary School. And it was both a before school program <laughs> and it was during a day uh, where they were pulled out as well. The teachers were specifically assigned to the enrichment program and they worked in multiple buildings. So, you know, anybody remembers like, uh, this is Carol Moloch back in the day, or Mary Hant, Glenn Rogers, who does the AIS and math and Project Lead the Way. He was a, an enrichment teacher. So it was, it was both, and it went on a rotational schedule. You seem to be pretty, pretty well versed with what was going on years ago. Were you, I mean, yeah, there were some really positives to it. I know the district went through some financial times. I was no longer working in the district. I had been gone for quite some time. Uh, but I do believe opportunities for enrichment is important. I just think we need to do it a little bit differently and gather that information. Well, I think that maybe you and Karen and um, Dr. Simmons can start that conversation even without anybody else, just to understand what happened before so that when you get everybody in the room and um, principals are, you know, working over the summer, maybe they can be involved at some, you know, point and we, we can get a meeting on the calendar before September because we have been talking about this all calendar year. So it just keeps getting pushed and... I did offer to meet with 
with Karen and, and Kevin right, so and the we, administration. That's great. So, so can we do that also? But it seems like, you know, we, I don't want to wait until we have all the players in a room to have the first meeting when you guys can sit and talk at least and explain what you remember it to be, what, what your vision could be, right. just throwing out ideas and, and then and again, sharing it with all those We did people, do that obviously. at the last instructional meeting. I did share with my overview of my experience and different things. Uh, you know, we were looking at different things. Karen had some ideas, I had some different ideas, but we did start those conversations. Well, then I think moving forward, it might be helpful to have instructional or maybe all board committee meetings on the calendar monthly. They're just on there so that there's no, oh, people can't get together. It's set in advance like these are. Well, I, I and then if you don't need them, then you don't have to I think have different it. committees require a different amount of, of, of time. I think there are certain committees that meet once a year. Some, depending on what's on the agenda, might need to meet more than that. I think that everybody that's working towards that is, is working in good faith. I think that nobody is trying to brush this issue aside. I, I think it's I one of those know. issues where... Just People's schedules I conflict. I, sometimes things aren't is doable. So that we is there get a possibility? Them on the calendar, they can't I, conflict. It just I seems think, to be more can, efficient. How about, how about we let the committee come to a decision when they can meet so that they can do the work and then they can report back at the next public so meeting. So is there a date that you guys can meet already? Mr. Sayle, maybe have to you get could, together we can set up a date and see what is doable with you three for that, each of them. A date where you'll set up a date yeah. to meet. So in other words, say a week from today, I'm you guys will have a date set up where you can sit down. I'm and around meet. almost all summer. I'm not over, I can't meet the first week of July, but I am around the entire summer. So and way, I could sit with Karen and with uh, Kevin, and we could set dates for meetings for the fall. Right, so. and no, Mike, I, know, I believe we did set a a tentative date on the 23rd, I just know it was graduation right. day, for an hour, and I think I had just asked, I know you had wanted the principals there, I, and my last question was, you know, were any of the principals available, but if it's just the three of us to get the ball rolling, yeah. that's fine. Um, but for now, I think my motion, my motion's a very basic, simple question. Um, so I'm hoping we can just take a vote on this motion, and I, you know, I'm gonna assume if anybody truly is interested in getting the enrichment program started then we'll we'll vote to, to get it started so let's the, we'll, we'll take a vote on the motion just to be clear it's the enrichment program that was run a decade ago just and in, just to get a cost, cost analysis today's numbers. Yes, because a decade ago okay. the numbers are very I'm, different than I'm now. just trying to be clear mrs. Murphy I, that's all I just trying to be you. clear very okay all, all those in favor aye, aye. all those opposed okay. aye. Mr. Monticello? I'm just dumbfounded and I understand we just finished saying we're going to try and meet and look at what the a, a valuable program is going to be and look like. And I'm not sure if just looking at what we did, how much it was. I, 10, I years totally ago understandable. We're just us. this is the motion that was brought Jerry, forward. Jerry, I'm Excuse just us, folks. trying to get it We're just, started. That's yeah. all. Mr. Marshall, this was the motion that was brought right. to no, the table. I'm sorry. It was tabled last time. Um, not much movement since then. So just to be clear, and we have that's exactly the point, Matt. There's been nothing since then. I was told if I table the motion, we could have a meeting. Like, Three weeks have come and gone. We've had no meeting. I, I think instructional. That, like I said, do you know we met twice this year? I believe everybody, We're a like I said, district, is working in good faith. And our instructional I do know at this time of year, a year, there are quite a few items on the district calendar that people are pulled in different directions. The community so it doesn't just, need to hear these conversations. We need to vote. We have a vote on the table. We're, Take we're a trying, vote. Mr. Cat. We're wasting trying. time. So we have, Ms. Marcello? No, we're, we're good. What's your vote? What's your vote? Oh, uh, no. Uh, motion fails to pass, three to four. It's a shame that we just don't, we don't want to get enrichment back in this school. I, it's a I, shame. I think it's absolutely not true. We all want enrichment, we want it to be valuable. So don't make comments that we don't want that because that's not true. I would never say something to put into your mouth. Please don't say things about my opinion if it's not accurate. So Jerry, I, when are we gonna we get just started? Said, you just said you have a meeting on the books for June 23rd. Three o'clock. You just said it. I had no idea, but you just said so. Okay. And I would a like some data to bring to the to meeting. To start it. And the thing is, right. I, want to, I, I value the time of our administrators, right? So I don't want them to waste their time doing something that is irrelevant. 
have the conversation, see what can be done, and when you have an idea as to what you want to accomplish, at okay, that point, we voted that's already. So, Mike, you're saying you think my irrelevant? idea is irrelevant? Yes. That's a little bit insulting. All right, folks, I folks, we, we've had the motion, we voted on it, time to move on. Oh, Any can other? I just say, I'm so sorry. Sorry, just one thing. Um, last week, um, Mike Sadens, you had said that teachers need a specific certification. Neil, do you happen to know you said what that possibly. is, or can you? I believe you said possibly. There's a, there's a certification for the teacher of the gifted, pro talented program. If it's a gifted and talented program. If we're just doing some sort of enrichment where they're not, they're still getting this, this you know, it's not anything in place of their education. I would it's enriching it. It, it would be, but then enrichment, it would be enrichment for all? No, no, I'm just asking if a teacher needs a special certification if we had an enrichment program, not a gifted and in talented. In terms of the teacher, if we're looking at it, and I'm sure Neil can speak to it, yeah probably a little bit more eloquently than I can, but if we're doing our beds code, which we're required to do every year in, in every school district, and we have to put down what the certification is for a teacher speaking, uh, teaching a specific program. If we have a teacher teaching an enrichment or a gifted program, whatever name we give to it, that's teaching out of certification, that's not something that the district is prone to do unless it's a, an emergency situation. Well, what if it is this, not, a, a, what if, I guess this is why I feel like the conversation needs to happen, because in my head, when I'm thinking of enrichment in elementary, I'm thinking of just how we had elementary this year, but in addition to that, there is enrichment before school, after school, at some point like that. So would that teacher need a certification, is but what I'm asking Neil. I, I think these are great conversations, but I think we're at the wrong venue. I think these are the conversations that should take place in the Instructional Review but Committee. That, that, and, and but that would be Satan's, would you be able to put certification as an agenda item yeah, the I next mean, time that you meet? that's something that Neil could share with Kevin to bring to the meeting on the 23rd. Thank you. I think that's the whole purpose of having these committee meetings, to really get in depth yes, that's with, but, and that's why we have these committee meetings. Two. Two, man. Not, that's good. All right. Awesome. Moving on. Any other unfinished business items? You had AC? Yes, I believe uh, one of the board members had brought up the possibility of central air. And I know that, for me personally, I, I know that as the climate continues to change, um, some people may believe that or not, but I think that we're, we, we have to head in that direction. And in time, in time, we're going to have to get to that point where buildings have, you know, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. I think that um, making incremental steps to get there would be prudent. I also think that people that had questions about that can go back to watch uh, the budget or the bond presentation where we did ask our architect about that. And then during the, I believe it was the second budget workshop, I believe we uh, brought it up again with Mr. Tobin who gave some answers. So without the, being repetitive, I know that's th that information has been put out there several times and is still available through video on our district website from the bond workshops and also the, uh, the district meetings as well. I think, how are we gonna get there though? Like, okay, we're saying we need to get there. I'm not an expert in, in No, I know. Neither am yes. I, obviously. So that, that's so, where you have professionals that So can we bring those professionals in? Because all we so far from what, again, just the way I've heard it is why we can't do it. Well, right so now, we, if you remember, it was when we did ask Mr. Cascone, the architect, the ballpark number off the top of his head was about $50 million. Yeah, it's not going to go down, right? The ballpark was about $50 million. And some of the things that they are doing is when they're doing work, if you remember, they're, they're retrofitting some of the buildings so that work would not be repetitive with the intent of, of moving towards the central air in the future. So it's on radar. We, we've talked about it several times, and um, it's something we're going to have to move forward with, but you know, at a $50 million price tag, it's mm -hmm. not something we're going to dive into head first right away. Can I just jump in real quick? Please. So, Please. Yeah. There is uh, two presentations that are that are available still on the website. The uh, September 21st open bond forum that we had here at New York Avenue, that is on when the architect specifically talks about the AC options, some of the pros and cons, and the estimated costs. Um, that is under the bond under the Board of Ed, and then you go bond vote 2021. Under the open forums, you'll see a video. 
Additionally, we also talked about at the November 9th meeting at two, of uh, a board meeting at November 9th. That presentation is also still available up on the website under Board of Education tab under 2122 presentations and reports. So these things were talked about. Um, some of the numbers we did talk about two different options. One, we're placing individual AC units throughout the district as, as in lieu of, of central air. Uh, that is less expensive in the range of seven to $10 million, but it creates some other issues. Specifically, it's not tied into the ventilation system, so it doesn't meet code. It would not be fully aidable by SED because of those reasons. Uh, it also can create uh, condensation issues potentially. Uh, because there's no dehumidification uh, system as part of those AC units. The other option was the full HVAC engineered system, which is similar to, to uh, central air. Uh, that cost, he's revised because of some, you've some of the work you've talked about, Mr. Gribben, that we're putting in some of the electrical capacity with the bond, but he still th said it would be upwards of 20 to 25 million. Uh, again, no issues with code. It would meet the code. It would be tied into ventilation and no condensation issues because there's the dehumidific dehumidification built into the system. Lastly, for any of this, we need a source of funding, right? The source of funding is something that needs to be voter approved. We just established the capital reserve, as we know, uh, this May, the voters approved that. Um, that is AC, was one of the many, many items that were included in that laundry list of potential projects. If AC was something that we wanted to do, of course, we'd have to build up to 25 million or so. That could, the only way we're getting that money is through surplus funds in the, in the budget. Um, that could take time uh, and we'd have to get there. And all those other projects would have to be forfeited. The other way would be to put up another proposition where we'd issue more debt to do that. Uh, the voters would have to approve both that and the debt uh, to do so. Uh, it would be a separate proposition like we had for the actual bond vote for a specific bond for air conditioning. So those are your two basic options. The long term would be through the capital reserve, get the money in there and pick it off that way, or go for another borrowing, have the voters approve that to have a separate proposition at a future uh, vote. So it's 25 million. 25 million, his, again, he's, he's being not, very rough, I'm not gonna, and I want to put him on the spot. If you say 26, I'm not going right. to, I'm just saying verse 50, that's half. 50, what difference. he was saying originally was, with all the electrical capacity additions that we're already building upon okay. in the bond. He, he's since revised that in those presentations saying, since we're doing some of that work already, because a lot of it's the electrical capacity. Mm -hmm. We just can't throw in right. units in every window. We don't have the electrical capacity. So we're trying to build up our electrical capacity to have that potential, and that's already in the, a large part of the bond. But again, still, that would be how the two ways we could do it. Do you think that the money that we're saving from solar, I don't even know if I said that right, but you know what I mean, right? I know what you mean, but gotcha. that is just, that's taking down our electric bill every month. So there's that. not, right, but I'm saying, right, I understand that's decreasing our electric bill every month, but we, the money that was earmarked for our electric bill is now not earmarked as much because we have a lower electric bill. So can that money get, where is that money going that can build up over time? It just I'm sorry, gives a Sorry, it just gives a credit. I'm sorry, my question's stupid or something? I know you're laughing at me, so I'm a little confused. Mm. We yeah. essentially I believe that money's passed along I'm to the taxpayer by joke. keeping the, the, the budget low as much as we can. So it's actually tax savings that we're using that $10 million dollars a year from the solar. And I think Mr. Letty is, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Letty is exploring other options and possibilities where we can add throughout the district with the intention of, of further electrical Thank needs you. in the future. Mr. Tobin, I'm impressed that you remember the dates of those presentations off the top of your head, but I'm not surprised at all. Um, Mr. So. Tobin, thank you very much. Um, we've been getting a lot of emails from community members asking about the AC, particularly when we had a heat wave a few weeks ago, and that was all I really wanted to get out to the community, just a you know, basic explanation as to you know, why there's not AC and what it would take to move forward with it. And also those presentations, I think, will be very, ha very helpful for people to... Uh, to go look up themselves, so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Tobin. Any other unfinished business items? Without any other items, continuing to move down the agenda, we have, um, I believe we have a policy committee report. Glad to see the policy committee was meeting. Yeah, so we had a couple policies, or two to be exact. 
that are on for first read tonight. Uh, the first one's going to be uh, policy 5151, homeless children that needed to be updated. That goes along with the McKinney-Vento Act educational law, and we needed to update the policy to be in compliance. Uh, the second policy that is going to be read tonight is policy number 9230, um, and that's going to be a first read for rescind, and the new revised 9240 will include the posting uh, vacancies. We did speak to this uh, a few meetings ago and came back at some suggestions during that, had some conversation here at the board meeting. Uh, we, there was some language that wanted to have all positions posted, and we put that language in, but we did add the term, if practical. A perfect example would be there are going to be times when we are going to have an emergency leave. Uh, let's say, God forbid, a elementary principal needed to take an emergency extended leave, you know, to go through the, and every building is mandated to have a building principal signed to them. So instead of going through a lengthy process to having to post and wait and have that position unmanned for quite some time, there would be a discretion in a situation like for the superintendent to put somebody that's been board approved or somebody in that position. But otherwise, all the positions will be posted and it works within the, the language and the constraints of the CBAs for both teachers and the administrative contract. Do you put it in a temporary basis or in it would be it would would not be for long term it would be to put somebody in there if it was going to be for extended time i'm sure dr secor and mr katz would come back to speak to the board about the situation with the plan uh, so it would be temporary to cover and then if some for a position that needed to be filled in an emergency situation otherwise it's going to go through the uh, you know the, the practice mike yeah. You know, it's interesting that uh, you use that one phrase, if practicable, because I had in my notes, that was the one thing I had an issue with. Um, it's such a loophole word. Is Could it be changed to for emergency purposes only or something that, you know, if pra it wasn't practicable because I had to leave early that day or, you know, it's a loophole word. It, it, it is a loophole word, I guess. I would, I would trust a superintendent, you know, and... and the cabinet that they're not looking to do a loophole or work through a back door, that the, it would be a genuine situation. Unfortunately, we've had situations where people had to go on emergency leaves that are not expected, uh, you know, and those positions need to be filled. Uh, we do have people that have worked in the district or have, you know, are known commodities that have come back and filled in for leaves here in, in you know, the 20 something years that I've been you know, a part of here as a, either an employee or as a, a community member. Um, so there was some other language that, that was changed in there, but we did leave that for that. If you'd like to hold off on the first read, we can. Yeah. Um, I, I would like to. It's, it's just so subjective, and, you know, this policy is... Do you have a suggestion for a better word? Um, well, I would leave it out altogether, if possible. I was just curious, because... Or, I know... say, in emergency situations only. I mean, okay. this policy is to protect... Our employees. If, if I'm not mistaken, do we not have to vote to put someone in temporarily as a board? We do. Even in the emergency situation? So Correct. it's not like it's yeah. carte blanche. We as a board have to approve yeah. whatever administrator to temporarily be in there. So Correct. we have that. It wasn't about, yeah. I guess. It so. wasn't about us voting for them. It was about having the opportunity for everyone to, who is interested in that kind of position to have that. So maybe if we do put something where it says in emergencies for required positions only, I mean, like you said, if, if you're mandated to have an, mm -hmm. a certain administrator mm -hmm. you know, in a position every day, like mm -hmm. if a principal's not there, obviously someone goes to cover, right? Even right. just on a general day. Right. So. If, God forbid, like you said, there was an emergency, you can't leave a building without a principal while we have a posting, have a closing date, which is understood, so... Well, I think, that, I think that speaks to administrative positions, but we have teachers that go out all the time. We have subs that then get assigned from a per diem sub to a leave of absence, a long-term sub. Again, that doesn't go through. Like, we still approve it on the agenda. It's put in when they're getting a change of their position, so we do do that. 
you know, again, I think we left that in there for that specific emergency type of situation, but I think we cleaned it up to make any new positions. Uh, if I could just make a suggestion. Sure. So, you know, again, this, this probably should happen in a, a policy meeting at this point. Why don't we table, why don't we table this, okay. for this uh, table it for now. Put it no, on no, the first we're, reading we're table next the first time. reading. Mrs. O'Connor, we're going to table the first reading for uh, 9240, right? Table the first and reading. And then, uh, I think, uh, Why do we have to table the first That's reading? That's all right. Can't we use well, it, it gives us, we find a better word. What is that? I, I wouldn't think so, because then we'd have to put that on for a first reading, wouldn't we? Oh, I, okay. right. I, I, so I, I think it makes sense to table the first reading today, sure. um, and then uh, uh, we'll have another policy meeting yeah. and put it on for the next meeting. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Sounds like a so plan. So we can expect for the next first reading that that freeze would be something different, or it could come back and say, "Sorry, we're doing it anyway." Oh, just no. We they'll have the discussion could, and policy meeting, and then they'll well, bring Stacey, a recommendation. We, we could have said that tonight. We did it. Right. I, I know. I'm so I, I'm not going back to say that we're going to go back to meeting and say too bad. You know, that's what we're doing. Okay. Otherwise, we would have just voted on tonight, which we didn't do. I'm just trying to move it along because this phrase was the problem last time. And the phrase there is were, still there. So that wasn't just thinking. this phrase. There was multiple things that we made changes to. It wasn't one thing that would have been simpli simplistic, and that's not it. We also needed, as we discussed at the policy meeting, that we do need to allow flexibility for the superintendent to fulfill positions, you know, when emergency situations arrive and do his or her job. It's understandable. You know, and as Jerry said, we come back to the board and it gets voted on, and whether we uh, approve it or, or not approve it, there's still that, you know, checks and balance system you know, where we have to be on board with that. And just so you're aware, when we have the policy meeting, we're also with council. And in that meeting, uh, we can speak to council further and, and get some advice from him and see if uh, what changes would be necessary, if any. And if they are, we'll make those changes and put on for the first reading next time. And council was a part of that meeting. Thanks. We did speak a bit at length about it to ensure that we had the flexibility to keep our building staffed and appropriately run. Sounds um, good. All if, right. if I may, I just want to make sure that, are we continuing with 5151 homelessness? Yeah, I believe it's just 9240. Okay. So table, table 9240. Okay. Hold off and on that. Mike. And then 9230. And 9230. 9230. Excuse us, 9230. And another que a question about um, well, 5151. A couple, like, errors, if I, would you want me to just send them to you to... To fix that, that. Yeah, that, that would be great. And then I, it was a very comprehensive policy um, on homeless children, and I'm just wondering, I think you said something about compliance. Is that the only reason there was a... You know, well, it needs to be, it needed to be updated. We had to follow the statutes that are there, and working with Mr. Goodstack, Goodstead, our attorney, made the recommendations along with Mr. Simmons to make sure that we're in compliance with what, you know, the okay. mandate is. No, I was just wondering if the state came down with new rules about it, and that's why you had to bring it up to... Mr. Goodset, do you want to speak to that? So when it comes to the, your education of homeless children and unaccompanied youth, the main thing is for there to be a removal of all barriers. And the policy as previously drafted doesn't set forth all the rights and obligations that homeless students may have. This policy is very law-driven. It's very specific with regards to McKinney Vento Homeless Assistant Act as well as Education Law 3209. Nothing in here is actually something that's subjective to the school district. It's all law. The whole purpose for this is to ensure that all homeless students or all accompanied youth has a removal of all barriers in order to get anything that they're afforded to under the law. So that's, that was the need for the change. Okay. Thank you. If, if I may, if it's I may, same. so basically you had a, you had a policy that was, it was, a, it was in board docs, it was two pages. We've basically oh. scrapped the entire policy and start afresh okay. Okay. because no, this okay. policy says pretty much nothing. So your new policy is, it's much more straightforward. It sets forth everything in the law that homeless students and unaccompanied youth are entitled to. And it's something that the district already practices. It's just now in writing. Thank you, Mr. Goodstadt. Thank you for the time and energy you guys put into the policy committee to make sure that we're updated and have accurate policies that reflect our practice. Now it's time for 
Dr. Secor, Superintendent Report. Dr. Secor. Thank you, Mr. Gribben. Uh, first, I'd like to speak to uh, a pressing concern that we all have related to school security. Uh, understandably, the tragic school shooting in Uvalde has prompted a national conversation about school safety. Thankfully, the district has made school security a priority for some time now. Our efforts in protecting those we teach and supervise are ongoing and remain a constant priority. Not because of a reaction to an incident, but rather as a proactive approach to strengthening our safety protocols in all of our schools. That said, we will always look for ways to improve in this area. In addition to the information that was shared in our recent letters regarding security, I would like to highlight the following. Over the last several years, the district has made several additional investments in various security initiatives, including the following. The dis district hired Covert Investigations as its security consultant in 2018. We installed security vestib vestibules and visitor management uh, system, otherwise known as Raptor, at all schools and in the central office. We installed exterior security booths at the secondary schools. We increased and enhanced security camera coverage district-wide. We installed a swipe access control system and other lockdown and lockout features district-wide. Over the last several years, we purchased additional security vehicles. And on this evening's agenda, we are asking for the Board of Education to authorize the purchase of two additional vehicles to allow us to post a security vehicle every day at every elementary school, in addition to the existing full-time security staff coverage at these buildings. The two new vehicles will be electric and will have the ability to be charged at the existing charging station at High School West. As I stated, stated earlier, this has been a district priority for some time. Also, the bond that was approved last fall and mentioned earlier this evening will help provide us with additional resources to bolster our existing safety and security measures. The budget was developed to include updated video surveillance and the ins installation of additional cameras. We will also be in installing new interior doors and locks, which is referred to as door hardening. The new security locks will operate in a manner that will lock classrooms securely without having to open the classroom door in order to set the door in a locked position. Let me con conclude by stating that we fully understand there are no guarantees that we can prevent every possible scenario, but that does not preclude us from doing all we can to ensure the safety of our students and staff. I also have to remind everyone that we cannot share all of the safety precautions because we would not want to give this information to a potential bad actor. I can assure you that this work will remain a priority for the district. Thank you. And now we have uh, two presentations this evening that we are excited to share with the Board of Education and School Community. First, we have Mr. Dan Helms, the district's Assistant Superintendent for Pupil Personnel Services, and Dr. Kevin Simmons, the, district, the district's su uh, Assistant Superintendent for Instruction and Administration and they will provide us with an update on the district's work associated with its, its strategic plan. Mr. Helms. Good evening and thank you, Dr. Secor. We want to speak to the community this evening and our progress with the district's strategic plan. We're very proud of the time, effort, and level of community responsiveness we have received in creating this plan. We have received over 4,000 responses from the school community to assist in generating this strategic plan. As you can see in the outline, we began our work in the fall of 2020 and have made continuous progress, readily building our momentum towards a finished product. We have conducted leadership workshops, created and distributed surveys to the school community, drafted and updated the district mission and vision statement, reviewed outcomes and metrics of surveys and focus groups, and currently are in the editing and drafting phase of the strategic plan. We are excited that the strategic plan will be operational and available to share with the community in the fall of 2022. The mission and vision was presented to the community in the fall of 2021 and garnered a satisfaction rate of over 90% from the 4,000 respondents. I'd like to read them once again. Our mission reads as, the Smithtown Central School District provides a safe, supportive, and stimulating environment for students to learn where all are valued. We are committed to educating well-rounded, lifelong learners who are compassionate, responsible, and ethical members of society. Our vision reads as, Smithtown Central School District's vision is to support each child in developing the fundamental academic and life skills needed to reach their maximum potential. The district's goal is to encourage a love of learning in students while fostering confidence, integrity, respect for others, and a sense of purpose and belonging. Our core beliefs have been identified through the strategic plan. 
The surveys and strategic planning meetings have all been instrumental in representing these beliefs and values. Community surveys were used to create common values that pertain to the Smithtown Central School District. These values from the Smithtown community were then presented to the strategic planning committee and to the focus groups for feedback before moving forward. They identified values for our school districts around a commitment to high standards and expectations for our students, respect and citizenship for all members of our school community, responsibility and integrity through honesty, hard work, accountability to ourselves and to those around us, and being student-centered and collaborative, which is evident through providing positive educational experiences for our students while creating and maintaining a school community which works together. These values and beliefs assist in guiding our work and providing the structure to the strategic plan. I'll now turn over to Dr. Simmons to explain the next phase of the plan. Thank you, Mr. Helms. Following an analysis of the strategic survey data, as well as the insights provided by the focus group discussions held with Dr. Jennifer Coyson from K-12 Insight, the committee has developed possible focus areas and goals. When it comes to teaching, learning, and instruction, we will provide high quality and innovative curriculum, instruction, and learning. Our goal is to have our students prepared to select and succeed in their chosen path beyond high school and grow every year towards their personal goals. With regards to student social and emotional well-being, we will provide a safe and inclusive environment that supports and meets the needs of the whole child. Our goal is to have our students demonstrate skills and attributes to cope with life challenges and achieve personal well-being. When it comes to district, uh, the district school and staff effectiveness and engagement, we will recruit, develop, and retain high quality uh, engage administrators and teachers and staff. Our goal will be to have our staff feel valued, are fully vested in student success, and that they receive the support that they need to be highly effective employees. In short, we want to hire the very best for the amazing students that we have here in Smithtown. The next focus area is parent and community engagement and satisfaction. Our goal will be to strengthen family, district, school, and community partnerships to support student growth and to ensure that our families and community members are valued and collaborative partners in promoting student success. The next steps as we proceed forward in our partnership with K-12 Insight, will this summer we will continue to make edits and revisions in our draft strategic plan and design. K-12 Insight will be delivering our final strategic plan in September of 2022. The board will adopt the strategic plan, uh, providing that they carry the votes in fall of 2022. And we will operationalize and share strategic plan with the community and begin the implementation in the fall once we have board approval towards that. We're looking forward to being able to share this work and the outcomes so this way we can try to make a difference in our students' lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Up next, we have, uh, once again, uh, Ms. Christine LaFries, our Director of Career and Technical Education, to provide you with an update on her work associated with career and technical education. Thank you. Good evening. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> Good. How are you? Good. Back up here again. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me here tonight to talk about the opportunities available to the students through the CTE department. We are very fortunate to have such a comprehensive program that provides real world connections for our students. A little background on me. I am a graduate of Smithtown High School East. I have two children in the district. I worked in the business world as an accountant before I came back to Smithtown to be a business teacher and now in the role of CTE director because of the ex exceptional programs that we offer here in Smithtown. In the CTE department, we have many educators that have come from various professions and they bring real world experiences to the students to enhance the learning that go, goes on in the classroom. In CTE, we provide career pathways that connect to career opportunities. Why is CTE so important? CTE provides students with opportunities to enhance their learning and work collaboratively with other academic areas to develop skills to be successful in the 21st century. Students enrolled in CTE courses report being more satisfied with their education because they can explore various career clusters and start to narrow their interest in what they may want to pursue in college and the workplace. CTE is an entirely elective area and we have over 2,000 students enrolled in courses from grades 9 through 12. 
As you can see, we have many opportunities in the three areas, and I will go into each one as I go more detail into each department. We'll start with the School of Business. We have a very robust School of Business offering over 20 courses and the opportunity for students to earn up to 45 college credits in various career clusters. We offer a wide array of courses from basic foundation skills such as keyboarding and computer applications to accounting, finance, marketing, personal financial management, sports, fashion, and a very extensive career program. We also are excited to have two New York State approved CTE pathways. We have one in marketing currently for students and we will be having one in accounting and finance starting next year. And they can be used for graduation requirements and also an additional endorsement on a student's diploma. These show prospective employers and colleges that a student took additional courses, participated in internships, and passed an assessment in an area they are interested in majoring in. We also have the largest DECA club in New York State. We participate in enrichment opportunities such as our Business Olympics and Business Etiquette Dinner. We strive to give our students the best experience possible to support them and help them to achieve success. Some pictures of some of the happenings in our department. Um, as part of providing students with unique opportunities, as you can see on this slide, we do that in various ways. We take the students on field trips to enhance curriculum. Uh, for example, this year the fashion classes were able to go to the Met to see a fashion show. Our VE students participated in a um, trade show at the East Wind. Students in the fashion club in the bottom right, um, are, they actually did a runway show at the PTSA fashion show at West. We partnered with the Smithtown Green team in our college marketing class to create the logo and slogan that the team is using now. I worked with Mrs. Finger with that, it was great. Um, and one of the capstone events in our department is the Business Olympics. I'm not playing the videos because of time. They'll be on the presentation later, you can see them. But the students, as you can see there in the finals, they're getting up on stage presenting in front of a group of um, the business people and judges in the auditorium, and it's just amazing to see them work together in teams. They're presenting to a panel of judges. They're incorporating technology, teamwork, and decision making. It is an event that our students always talk about as something that was so helpful to them when they go to college because not too many schools have these opportunities for the students, and I know some of you have participated as judges and can attest to, to what it does for, th for them. Hey guys, welcome to the vlog. Sorry, okay. High School Heroes Junior Achievement is another program that we have uh, where we work with the elementary students. We've been doing this for about 10 or 15 years now with Junior Achievement, and the high school students go into kindergarten and second grade classes, and they teach lessons to them on civic consciousness, community members, financial management, and it's a great experience for both the high school students and the elementary uh, students. Actually, both my daughters got to participate in it. And um, it really teaches them leadership, teamwork, and they get up and they're the teachers for the day with the elementary students. And the, the kids love seeing them there, so they're like rock stars to the elementary kids. So that's another authentic experience we have for them. And then we have our virtual enterprise program, which has really grown over the last five to six years, actually countywide. Um, we are fortunate that we have um, two firms, one at High School East and one at High School West, True Blues at West, Seasonals at High School East. And it's really a um, very authentic learning experience because the students participate and they run the class. They basically are every department, they're doing the marketing, they're deciding what products they wanna sell. You could see the pictures there for some of the trade shows that we've been to in the past. Um, and they actually, they create everything. They have to sell, you come around with fake credit cards and you can buy merchandise. And um, it really is amazing to see what they actually accomplish and they, they are doing. And when you speak with them, you wouldn't know you're speaking to high school students. So we're looking to continue to, to grow that in the future. And then you heard a little bit about um, our marketing club, DECA. Um, it's one, as I mentioned, one of the largest clubs in our school. Um, we participate in many activities. We have local, state, and national competitions. And as I mentioned, I was a former business teacher before in this role. And for the 20 years I was in the department, we've always had students place and go to nationals, like where, where we have very competitive kids that really rise to the occasion. And we have advisors and teachers that work really hard with them. And you could see the pictures there of the kids that have placed in the different activities. They also participate in community service, fundraising, and it teaches them time management. It teaches them professionalism, collaboration, community service, networking, resume. I mean, you meet these kids and they just really blow, you, blow me away um, with what they do. And again, this is all done outside of their school day. So I'm just playing a quick couple of seconds from high school. Evening. Hi, I'm Megan Riley, and I'm this year's DECA president. 
Today, the officers and I are going to be talking a little bit about what DECA is and why you should join. DECA allows you to learn public speaking skills, gain career experience and opportunities, practice job interviews, and network with local business professionals. Joining DECA also allows you to create new friendships. By joining the club and attending events, you will be able to meet so many new people and create so many strong friendships. DECA also has many community service and fundraising events to help your community. So that's just a little snippet of what the students have to say about getting involved. Uh, we also have our School of Business Honor Society, uh, where we have our New York State Business Honor Society that we induct the students at the etiquette dinner. Um, and we also have our personal higher degree, our PhD. I know Mr. Stadens has been at the uh, etiquette dinner before. And it really is um, a unique opportunity. Our IAB members uh, sponsor the students, and they get to look, practice their networking skills and actually how to behave at a business dinner. And you learn some things that you might not have known from some of our etiquette experts that have been there before. Um, so again, another unique experience to really work on those soft skills. Uh, we also do job interviewing, resume writing workshops, and career speakers. And we have a large community connection as well. Now we'll move into family and consumer sciences. Um, over the years, we really have grown and expanded the opportunities available to our students in family and consumer sciences. And I like the quote that we have in the box up there, real skills for real life. In the middle school, um, here's an example of some of the topics that we cover, um, sixth grade, goal setting, peer pressure, um, hand sewing and machine sewing, um, because you know it's the first introduction for the sixth graders coming from elementary school, so we really try to work, focus in on those skills and friendships and kind of how to get yourself acclimated to the middle school. And then they love making their pillows. That's the pictures that's there of the pillow projects. And some of them are quite impressive. Um, they do embroidery, I mean, much better than, than I could ever do. I've learned a few things from them in the class. Um, in seventh grade, we move into doing some financial management, nutrition, kitchen safety, and we start cooking. As you can see, two students there with their personal pizzas, that's their favorite thing to make, that and pretzels, and chocolate chip cookies. Um, and we, we infuse those skills with the financial management and, and rights and responsibilities of consumers. And then moving into eighth grade, we focus a little bit more on careers, entrepreneurship, meal planning, um, some additional food and safety. We do a food truck, because you know they all love to watch all the food shows, so we do a food truck um, pro project with them, and they like doing that, and some child care and babysitting, because some of the kids are starting to get into that. So that's a little bit of the skills that kind of spirals them into the high school, which here, and there's links up there on the presentation to take you to all the courses that we have in the high school, as well as we now have two New York State approved CTE pathways in family consumer science as well. Um, one in human development for this year, and next year I'm very happy we will have one in food and nutrition. You know, the, student, the children are getting much more interested in what they eat and their exercise and how important it is with, for their mental well-being that we were able to get this implemented. And a big part of getting that approved by New York State was the food science course that we offer for the last couple of years. We introduced that. And the ne the next year, the students can get four college credits for that food science, and some of them can also use it for their third credit of science. Um, we run a child care, I mean a nursery program and child development, which is wonderful to see. Actually, my two daughters were in it when they were little. And um, the high school kids, run they're the teachers. They plan. They do everything. It's so nice to have the little ones back in, in the classroom um, now. And they, they do everything. They, they purchase the supplies. They're, they're just, they run it like they're the teachers. And the, the family consumer science teacher is there to facilitate with them. So that's a great room to walk into, especially during the day, seeing all the little ones running around and being so excited. And then we have some interior design as well. Um, on the food side, we have the chef's choice classes. You can see they make some really good food. Baking, um, we're adding a baking too because we had such an interest. And then we have clothing construction. I like, um, we picked this picture in the middle because this is really what the family consumer science teachers are doing. You know, it's not just about what they're making, it's about all of those other connections to the other curriculum that we see. So you see students cooking and sewing, they see reading, measuring, math, science, following directions, collaboration, listening, and problem solving. So these are skills that last a lifetime, which is so true, and I know we can all you know, attest to that. We have competitions in our food classes, grilled cheese challenge, cupcake wars, pizza challenge. I have to tell you, they put a, a list out to the teachers and it fills up like that for the sign up to kind of get the food and, um, and choose the winners. And they're very creative with that. Co-curricular, we have FCCLA, which is our middle school. We now have chapters in every middle school and the two high schools. 
Um, so some of the things they get involved in at middle school, they do fundraising, charitable events, team building and competitions. There are some pictures of some of the things they get there and it's just making them better citizens and you know, to learn about their community and how important it is. And then in high school, same thing, um, we get involved in fundraisers, we do food drives, um, we had an annual wellness fair. Um, we made, at High School West, they did a um, homemade pie sale for the holidays for the staff. And we started a elementary fruit and veggie challenge. So again, making that connection with the elementary schools that we hit every elementary school and the, we sent videos to them, the high school students taught them about eating healthy and then we picked a winning class from every um, elementary school and they got a prize for how many fruits and veggies they ate. So that was pretty cool. And then we made window shirts for pediatric cancer patients for the ports that they have and we donated those. So they sewed those and, and made those. So making those connections is important for them. So that's a little snapshot of facts. And then moving into technology, we've really revamped our middle school technology program over the years. We have incorporated Project Lead the Way into our entire middle school curriculum. In grade six, students take 20 weeks of technology, 10 are tech lit, where they do digital citizenship, CAD, research, and then 10 weeks of science of technology, where they're focused on chemistry, physics, and nanotechnology, and engaged in hands-on activities. In grade seven, they focus on technical drawing by hand and with CAD, and their culminate, culminating project involves them designing, engineering, and building prototypes of toys for children with special needs. So they do the research and they learn about that. In eighth grade, they focus on robotics, and you can see there they learn gear ratios and programming to perform a specific task. So the curriculum empowers students to solve real world challenges and inspire them to reimagine how they see themselves. They also have the opportunity to take two electives, flight and space and energy in the environment in grade seven, once we don't have the, the study halls in, in middle school, and in eighth grade, green architecture and magic of electrons. So again, two more project lead the way units that the students can use. We also have community connections. They help build the sets uh, for the plays in many of the schools. And there you see them working with the ENL students and they worked on those signs that's at a composite middle school in all the different languages. They worked on building them. And then we have middle school first Lego League. You saw the high school kids here. This is where they start in middle school. We have it at a composite Great Hollow and Nessequake. And then high school, the course guide is linked there as well. Um, we really have expanded our high school program. We have Project Lead the Way courses in engineering and computer integrated manufacturing, as well as robotics, which prepares students who want to major in engineering or computer science using CAD design software, 3D printers, laser engravers, and CNC machines. I mean, you walk into those shops, I mean, I put a couple of pictures up there, and it's just amazing what our students have access to and how well prepared they are for majoring in these fields, especially manufacturing. Every Long Island company comes to us and says how they would need manufacturers and they need these students to go into these fields, so we're really focusing on that. Um, they really prepares them for college and career. Uh, we also support the trades and courses in construction, automotive, small engines, and computer repair and cybersecurity. And we have a new course next year, DIY, Introduction to Trades, which we're gonna cover a little bit of everything, including plumbing, construction, basic auto, and electrical. And you could see the shops that we have. They make Adirondack chairs in the wood shop. Um, and this year they made one that they donated to Relay for Life um, that you were talking about that they used for this weekend. So it, it was nice. And then you know about the robotics team, so I'm gonna skip over that because the kids did a much better job than I can ever do explaining about the team and the skills that they've learned. Um, I just think the one takeaway from the robotics for me was oh, when I first started getting involved in it, not being a tech person, was how much it involves so many skills besides being the tech person. They have the kids that wanna program and code, but they have the kids that do the website, that are part of the, the business program, and then they, the teamwork, the collaboration, making mistakes, the critical thinking is really, is really amazing to see those kids work. And then new this year, they mentioned it a little bit in their presentation, um, they came up with this Get Set for Success, Midtown Engineering and Technology. And I also oversee the STEM specialists in the elementary school for Project Lead the Way. And we, in speaking with them and the high school team, we came up with going to all the elementary schools this year and presenting to the fifth graders about the robotics team so that when they do their coding unit in uh, their robotics unit in grade five, they now can understand the reasons why they're doing it. So we went right when they were doing it and it made that connection for them and it was wonderful. The kids, as you can see, they got very excited and the high school kids were, were very excited to work with them as well. And we have a tech honor society and we have an esports and gaming club. Um, 
as well in the technology department. So we really try to hit everyone. And then the last thing that falls under CTE, um, but probably the most important for us, is our Smithtown Industry Advisory Board. Some of you have members, some of you have been to the meetings before, but they really are our partnership with the community. I know many of the departments have talked about making those, those connections, and we have over 200 active partners that are involved with us. They help us with mentoring, guest speaking, sponsorships, scholarships. They judge Business Olympics, Business Etiquette Dinner, our business awards. Um, they really enjoy being with our students, um, hosting, shadowing. They work with the robotics team, the DECA kids, the FCCLA kids. So these are a list of just some of them. But we, uh, Mary Pat Grafstein, who's our current um, industry advisory board coordinator, who is retiring, um, she has done a wonderful job of continuing the mission of what Sue Gooping had started and, and really getting these partners involved. And what, they love working with our kids. Um, and this year we celebrated our 45th anniversary at the Business Etiquette Dinner. So we've been in existence. We are the oldest and largest industry advisory board on the island. So we really are pioneers in Smithtown for many of the things we do in CTE. Not too many schools have the depth of programs that we have. Um, so I feel very fortunate to be working you know, here and being able to do that. And then just, I know some other departments, and we've mentioned this in other meetings, the alumni. You know, they're really, they're, they're the proof of what we're doing and if we are successful or not. And I just put some up here on these next couple of slides. I'm not reading them just so that you have them there. Just to show how many, we have hundreds and hundreds of alumni that come back and just talk to us about all of the things that they learned in our courses, participating in DECA, Business Olympics, um, the Family Consumer Science, courses that they took, the technology being part of that, and all of the colleges that they've gone to um, and how much it has helped them when they went to college and then their careers. So they really are that we're showing our skills are transferable, you know, and really we love when they come back and tell us these stories. And lastly, um, you know, I really need to thank my staff. I have some of them. They weren't happy when I put together. <laughs> I didn't show them this. Um, their pictures on the presentation. but. Um, I, really would, I really have amazing teachers, my instructional specialists. They work very hard. They're always willing to go above and beyond. We put a lot of time in, as does everyone outside of the day, um, for the program and the students. They really want what's best for them. They truly believe what we do and how beneficial it is to the students. And we really pride ourselves on always being steps ahead of other districts on Long Island for CTE. So I want to thank you uh, for your support and guidance throughout and allowing us to be able to do all this. So thank you. Wow, Mrs. Lafrice. Sorry, the first... I know that was fast, but I had a lot to no. go through, and I know it's late. <laughs> that was great. That was great. I think the first thing that jumps out to me is just the, the possibilities that are offered, you know, to really to suit anybody's interests. And um, the more we give them, the more possibilities that you know kids have to do whatever they, you know want really yeah. and follow their dreams or even maybe even find something that they, they might not have thought they were interested in yep. you know and so there's so many different things and, and that's I think probably one of the most impressive things with your presentation I always love the fact when high school kids can go down to elementary school and um, you know just you see the little guys faces light up when they see the the, the, the high school kids and you know it just creates connections whether it, it be the high school kids looking forward to you know, going to, to really teach the little guys or, um, you know, just the anticipation of seeing, you know, the older kids come to the elementary school. So that, that's always awesome. And, no, um, it is. So Especially when for, they clap, the, the teachers clap. They always find that amazing that everyone gets quiet. And I know what I used to try to go back in, and I used to try that in my classes, and it didn't work as well as it does in elementary school. But <laughs> Yeah. So, well, well, thank you for the presentation, and uh, very impressive. Thank you. Matt, if you don't mind me adding. Please. please. Uh, first of all, Christine, your humbleness. You know, the things that you do behind the scenes to support this program, you know, are, it's, it's instrumental to our success. You know, you. The, the active participant that you are, you are at everything. You, your teachers can lean on you for everything that you need. You're always looking for the next best idea. One of the things that I think you, you've done a beautiful job is really welcoming our community and and local businesses to partner with you, to partner with our kids. You know, I don't mean to embarrass Mr. Foster, but yep. anytime <laughs> I am at a business Olympics, an, an etiquette dinner, he's either there with the kids, donating his time, supporting the kids financially, so they're there. But seeing so many people in our community, 
you know, giving an opportunity for people like Mr. Foster and so many others that want to give back and, and have so much to offer, I think that makes our program so special. So please no, know does. how much uh, we all appreciate what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of our parents, Mr. Foster, our partners, our community, yeah. you know, that really step up and give our kids that hands-on experience. No, they really do. We couldn't do what we do without your support, administration, and, and the community. And we're very grateful. And my teachers, a lot of them are still here sitting in the audience. So they came out to be supportive. So they're, that's how they, that's how it, they are. It so doesn't work without them. No, we're like a right? family. No, it does not. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. Thank especially, you. especially robotics, people have no idea the amount of time that team spends to, with the kids all days, weekends, nights, travel. I'm sure their families are uh, pulling to get them back home, but you know the things that they do for our kids around the clock, it's truly unbelievable as an example of you know how great teachers can be and how great some of our teachers here in Smithtown truly are. So yeah, are. thank you to you as well. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Right. Thank you. If I may, I couldn't agree more. I, I took gr a great deal of pride in our work in these areas in my previous two districts, but this is next level. Uh, the, the sheer depth and breadth of the opportunities you afford students, it's phenomenal. And when you sent me this presentation, I replied, you captured the awesome. Yeah. It's exactly what we're looking for with these presentations is to share with the community all that is great that is out there and the work that is done, the joy we see in our students, whether it be here, but especially at those elementary schools. Yeah. And I thought the high school kids had as much fun, if not more, yes. than even the elementary students. And you are readying them for whatever it is they choose to do, and that's why we're here, so thank you. No, it is. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, up next, uh, we have a resolution. Uh, I would ask for the board to vote on setting the annual reorganizational meeting uh, for July 1st at 11 a.m. So we have a motion to approve item 10C. Motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, the. I, I guess I'm not understanding why the reorganizational meeting is being moved. It's set by the state to be on June 5th. Um, and I don't understand why, you know, oh. just an explanation sure. as to why you're moving sure. it to the first would be um, fantastic. I'll, I'll explain it again publicly. I, I think I tried to do that with our board communication as well. But um, if we do it publicly also, that's fine. I believe it's the district policy that states the Reorganizational meeting should be on the first Tuesday in July. Every so State often, policy. every so often, there's a conflict with July 4th, where you know we have um, that Tuesday either falls on July 4th or the next day, the day before. Either way, and um, there was conflicts this year with people that had uh, family plans or family vacations that were scheduled already. So, um, in an effort to try to find a mutual date where everybody would be able to attend. That was what, what transpired, and, and unfortunately, we weren't able to find a, a, a date that worked for everybody. So we were able to put a resolution that where we would move the reorganizational meeting to July 1st, not stating that any, any one trustee is more important mm -hmm. than one another. But at the reorganizational meeting, I believe one of the things the community expects, and we look to highlight, is the, the swearing in of either newly elected or re-elected board members. And that's one of the things where we were uh, looking to find a date to fit that. So I hope that you understand. And um, I would not a slight would, on anybody, but... Um, um, I would really like yeah. to offer a compromise, if possible. So I believe we tried that several July, times. July 5th was the date of the state-mandated meeting, actually. Um, I, I understand Mike and Mike want to be sworn in in front of their friends and family, and I would not deny them that. I think they should. Um, Stacy and I were sworn in last year in the boardroom on July 1st, as is allowed. So if they are available on July 1st, could they please do their swearing in on the 1st? with their family, friends, and whoever else would like to come, and then keep the reorganization meeting on the 5th. So there were five people available on the 5th. Um, again, this meeting has been set since last year. I mean, next, I, 
I know next year's meeting is July 11th. I hope nobody makes plans for next July 11th. All right, it's always the second Tuesday of July. First Tuesday. I, I'm sorry, the first Tuesday of July. This is the second because of the 4th of July falls on that date. Um, but it seems like truly you're saying that it's more important to move it to a date when two people are available that another two aren't available. Oh, um, next year is, is up in the air. You're saying it could it could be July 11th. I don't know. It's, it's got to be. July it's, it it has to be. It doesn't year. have to be. It but has Matt, to be done in, in but, within the first 15 days. Hold on one second. It could be done depending on what the calendar looks like. You know, we have the ability to move it to a mutual date where we, we are able to move district business and um, also, right. like I said, swear in newly elected or re-elected trustees. But you can do the swearing in on July 1st without moving the reorganizational meeting. Well, either date that was suggested, the several dates that were suggested, mm -hmm. was not going to achieve 100% attendance by the board okay. members' responses. So, and so I, I think it would be a fair compromise if you did the swearing in on the 1st and the reorganizational meeting on the 5th. Therefore, we chose July 1st as one of the, the, the best appropriate date to hold the reorganizational meeting. So on July 5th, five of us can come. Is that correct? I don't know that. Okay, well, that was in our community, right. I, I don't know. Okay, well, we all just determined that, just that together that we, in an email system we, that... We just had conflicts where not no, everybody was not. able... To, no, excuse me, Can Mr. I, Murphy. I know I was talking, though. No, I'm trying to set talking the record me. straight. Okay. Oh, there were several dates that were put out. None of them were able to achieve and 100 And five attendance. people confirmed so they could make are. it on July 5th okay. at the reorganizational meeting. And five people confirmed, okay. a different five, that they could meet on July 1st. I looked through so the emails it, and I did not count five. I don't even believe you let me know what you were able to attend Because I can not. do either. So then how do you know you had five? Because I know I can count and I'm the fifth. So I Great. just... All can, we all can count, and well, it, it, just, just and in the and in the past when we've had a board that was willing to work together, that we would be able to set at this meeting a date that we can all come together. And typically, we have a date that we all select. It doesn't always have to be the first Tuesday, and we were able to work together to find a mutual date. Mike and I were just reelected. I expect to be at the reorganization meeting. You know, as does Mike. We are un unable to attend on the fifth, and I and I put out a very nice asking email asking to see who could make it, and we can find a compromise. So at the reorganization, we set leadership, we set all these different things, and I expect to be a part of that. As does Mike. I don't want to speak. I for believe you. I believe the community expects you to be there as well. Okay, and and I responded that I can't be there July one. Okay, especially at eleven o'clock, I said I might be able to make. We, we know you're busy. Can I, can I finish, please? Thank no. you, Matt. I said I might be able to make between 4 to 5 o'clock, but being that I have a bunch of agents that will be going on vacation, I'll be in a lot of coverage, I won't know until the day or two before. But apparently that wasn't picked up. It was just said the 11th, so I, I guess I just don't matter. If so, Like so I said wait, before, if I, if I, I said not one trustee is more important than the other, but I did say the rationale as to why to come to a date where we would be able to get our newly reelected can, can I board just members be, sworn in. Mike, can you explain okay. to me why, I understand why you want to be at the reorg meeting. All we seven of us do, of us. everybody does. So whether you got elected this year or last year, it, it doesn't, everybody wants to be there. Everybody expects to be there and everybody deserves to be there. So can you explain to me why moving the date because you deserve to be there is any different than moving the date so he can't because he deserves to be there too so, so just when that we put this to to, when we put this out there was no other offers except for you said sent us back the board policy that it says it has to be the first tuesday of the month that's what she sent back we try to find a date yeah. that we could all do and but that you, did not yeah, but and that you, no let, let me finish, finish please Th Thank you. that that was not successful you know, so we're sharing partial stories here. We looked to find a day that we all could work. And we couldn't do it, right? We couldn't find a date that we, we could we all. We couldn't. In, That's in why we have 50. a resolution so here my, for July 1st, which we will vote sentence. on I'm, I'm shortly. I'm still discussing, so I, I can still have that opportunity. So the, the policy states that the reorg meeting has to happen in the first 15 days. That can't be, right? That has to happen, first 15 first days. First 15 okay. days. So because of everyone's okay. personal schedule. Unless there's a board resolution. Okay. So because of everyone's per oh wait so we can have it after July 15th? No. That's what okay so let me restate that. The reorg meeting has to happen within the first 15 days of July. That's correct, right? Okay. 
So because of everyone's personal schedules, and we all have that, we have families, we have vacations, I don't think anybody should be frowned upon because they're going away with their family for crying out loud. So we have to do within the first 15 days, people have family vacations going on. We came up, there was two dates it seemed, the fifth, the date that's in the policy, that two people can't make, and then the only other date that would work because of people's vacations, it, the only other date in the first 15 days was July 1st. So we can't throw out any other dates because everyone indicated that there was no date that all seven could be there. You never indicated what worked for you. Because I did both. But because you're saying you're saying you have specific dates on who can attend what. No, but I'm you just never, going based on. I'm what just other, I'm just saying what you the information just, you gave us. You never I, told us or me I, I what you're wanna, able to attend. So it, first you're kind of contradicting my, yourself. My, can you stop? I, Matt, all I'm saying is you have 15 days to have the meeting. Yeah. We have the first and the fifth available. Why are we moving it from the fifth when five people can attend to the first when a different five can attend? I explained that at the beginning. No, but you didn't explain. Well, you just explain didn't like what you why. Had. No, explain okay. why Mike and Mike have to be there and they don't. I did. I, I, no, no, I just want to I did. Not I, I might not have liked it, but I, I did. I never confirmed that I was available oh, on the fifth. No, no, what was that, Mrs. Murphy? I, I couldn't hear you. It is? Yeah, okay. It is. All right. Well, you know what? When you have people that are unwilling to work with each other, yes, that's what it turns into. I'm sorry. And why are you two not willing to work? Why is it always other people not willing to work? I, I, who do you think who do you think tried to come up with the mutual date? It's not mutual. Who do you, do you think tried to come up with the mutual date okay. for can everybody? Can I just quickly respond okay. and then we can put this to a vote? So you have to pick what, and, and that's exactly what we did. Oh, oh. Exactly what we did. People that are that are getting sworn in. In, in but years past, they can past, be sworn in when, on the first, and I, that would be a compromise. The 30th, they're allowed in, to be sworn in, on in the years day. past, when I've been on this board, there was absolutely no issue with picking a new date. Right? We would say, Hey, by the way, I'm not available this day. I'm not available this day. I'm not available this day. Let's find a date within the first two weeks that work. Right? And it was a very, very simple and easy response. Okay. And everybody made it work. Good. Now, we have an email that goes okay. out that says... It's, not a, it's, it's a difficult thing to get a date for instructional. That's acceptable. But this is like, no, I can't that, believe nobody has you know, it's, a date. It's, it's, you're throwing out things that's not accurate and that's not fair. You're talking about trying to find a meeting date at the end of the school year, which you are extremely aware that it's nearly impossible with everybody's calendars and any your events as trying as to find that. Should be a can I, can I just finish? Right, let's, just just vote. Just, let's just vote. Let's just, just not, vote. Can, can you know, just, and the fact that, just excuse me, Mike, the fact that we're sitting here arguing like this in public, on camera, that's being broadcast live is an embarrassment. We need to go back to focusing on what we're here, that's the best interest of kids, and focusing on bringing our community back together. Enough is enough. I second that, Mr. Sadens. I second so, that. So, Mike, if, you want, if that's what you want to do, you want to get back to focusing on that, then could we please make a compromise? Right. I'm not missing the reorg meeting, Karen. Either I'm not missing it. Okay. So, so she with, has to. With that being said, yeah. any other what further comments? How about she? What if? Any other further my, comments? I, but you have. How can you say that I'm not missing it? You oh, miss it. Mrs. Murphy, I said. It, I said at the beginning, and I I'm said during emails. Not one trustee is more to, important I'm, than the other. I'm Mr. Catalano. I'm sorry. I mean, Eleven o'clock on a Friday. This is ridiculous. If I, if I, can I, can I please, just go ahead. my thought, Go ahead, Mr. Please. Cat. So when we had the email, we, just as we've had in years past, hey, who's available when? I got uh, the fifth, maybe the first, okay. It was a, a couple of emails going back and forth. And the one response that we received was, here's our policy, it'll be the fifth unless we vote otherwise. We didn't receive yes. anything else, no other dates, here's our policy, that's it. I'm here, I'm available on the 5th. We have five people available on the 5th. That's all I'm willing to do. So here we are. We have four and three, and we know that there's a divide here. I don't understand why we would take those positions ever, but we are. So here we are. We've, we're now in a position where we have to vote because that's what you asked for. All right, well, my response was, okay, I can't do 11, but I can possibly do three and four, but I won't know a day or two before because I run a business and people rely on me to be there and I have a bunch of agents that will not be in there taking vacation and it's in my NASA office, not the one in, in Smithtown. But you know what? 
That being said, just vote and let's put it to bed. Sounds like a plan. All those in favor? Oh, Mr. Marcello? Oh, my. Can we, and I don't know everyone's schedule, can we amend it to do it at 4 o'clock? And if then we have the six person. He's not unable and to be there at 4. We have people not able to be there at 4. Okay. We have people that not was, able to be there at 11. Yeah. Like, like I said, there's not a perfect date. Okay. Right, Jerry, so I, that's what we have I to do. Think we that's, have to, that's hold on, fair Mr. as Jerry, well. We, we I, 11 o'clock on a Friday, some of us work. So if it could be later again, in the afternoon, again, perhaps. There's, there's no mutually like, agreeable day for everybody. For you guys. Okay. That's all right. So, no. all right, we ready to vote? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes four to three. Reorg will be July 1st at 11 o'clock right here in New York Ad Avenue Auditorium. Not everything has to be a challenge, which we're trying to work together to figure this but all out. But you're not trying to work with no, us, Matt. I, I beg to differ. I Matt, beg to differ. I mean, we're asking for a couple hours beg, later in the I've day. I've asked for, for several compromises. Nobody's willing to work for that, so here we are. Okay. Yeah, here we are. Dr. Secor. Yes, up next we have uh, just some calendar notifications on Monday, June 20th is uh, Juneteenth and schools are closed but the central office will be open. On Thursday, June 23rd, we have High School East and High School West graduation scheduled for 5 o'clock. Should there be an issue with weather, they would be rescheduled for the same time the next day, the 24th. And on June 28th, we have regular meeting of the Board of Education where we'll, we'll going to executive session at 7 p.m. and the regular meeting is to reconvene at 8 p.m. Up next, we had policies that were on the agenda, but I believe those were addressed during the committee reports. Yeah, we still have one though, 5150? 5151. 5151, excuse me. Correct, Dr. Simmons? One of Mike's favorite albums. <laughs> So we, with the first reading, we just mentioned we're speaking of it. We're not voting on anything, though. Correct. Correct. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Anything else in your uh, superintendent's report, Dr. Secor? That's it. Thank All right. You. What's that? You don't have to. You don't have to. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't think we have to do that. It's in the uh, in the agenda. So. Cool. All right. Mrs. O'Connor, do we have anybody signed up for the? Consent agenda items of public participation? No. All right, moving on to consent agenda. Does any board member wish to remove any items from the consent agenda as we look to vote on it as a whole? I don't want to remove anything, but there's something I'd like to speak to about uh, the early voting with the Board of Elections. Yep. Um, I understand there's no school in session at that time, and we are beholden to the Board of Elections. But I think it's time we start having conversations about moving the elections out of the school buildings. Uh, at the school board election, I went to my school building where I'm supposed to vote, and security was there. They were watching. They were keeping an eye. But the kids were still walking around. The doors were open. And I, th I think it's important we start working on getting the elections out of the school buildings when school's in session. I think those are valid concerns. I think it definitely is deserving of a conversation on um, exploring some options. Are you wishing to remove that item, though? No, I'm not. No, because okay. there's, there's no school in session that day. Okay. Anybody else looking to remove an item from the consent agenda? Without any removals, we have a motion to approve consent agenda items 13 through 18. Motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Dr. Secor, you have some highlights for us. I'll turn it over to Mr. Katz. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Secor, Mr. Gribben. I, I would like to uh, mention a few items tonight that the board did approve appointments of some individuals, and I'd like to welcome them to our staff and congratulate them. If any of these folks are still with us this evening, if you would please stand to be recognized. Michael Harvey is a science teacher who was with us this year, will be back with us next year in a different capacity. Tony Cohn, an ENL teacher. Sarah Campbell in health. 
Carissa I in physical education and Vincenza Patron in physical education. All right, congratulations and welcome aboard. And of course we had uh, three phys ed and health combination folks on and it's more, even more appropriate then that the board did approve the appointment of our new coordinator for athletics, physical education, health, nurses, and whatever else Dr. Simmons can come up with for you, Jason. Uh, congratulations, welcome aboard as an administrator, Jason Lambert. Congratulations, welcome to our team. Congratulations, I'm extremely excited to hear about all the great things that uh, you guys do in the district in the future. All the best. I would like to highlight quickly in the consent agenda, the board approved um, a couple of extremely generous donations, one by Mrs. Sill and the Greg W. Sill Foundation, and the other by the High School West Classroom General Organization for the Greg Sill Scholarship. We also received another scholarship donation by the Suffolk County Chapter of the New York State School Facilities Association. Uh, anytime the district's able to you know, receive gifts from community members or you know, organizations, we're extremely grateful, and we thank you for those generous donations. Appreciate it. Uh, moving on, new business. Does any board member have any new business items? Yeah, I, I got something. Um, I want to mention earlier, but I forgot. Um, I received an email, and it's in reference basically to the buses. Um, right now, I mean, you get an Amazon delivery. Everybody knows where the truck's going to be. We had that driver here who was awarded because he saw a child sitting still. Is there any way we could speak to our bus company or have tra transportation speak to them about maybe providing an app for the parents and also for the students? A lot of students currently have cell phones where they can see where their bus is so they know if the bus is not coming, maybe call somebody instead of just sitting at the bus stop and waiting or if a bus breaks down. It's a simple app. Parents can have access to it and also children who have cell phones so they know exactly where the bus is and when the bus is coming. It's just for additional safety for our children. That's a conversation we can have and we've actually been discussing just that uh, within our communications committee and we've been talking to some very industrious students uh, regarding an app that they've created uh, that would be a great communication tool for our students that the parents could potentially access as well. They, uh, Certainly that would alumni, involve, right there, I'm sorry? Dr. Alumni, Dr. Sequel? Alumni, yes, two high school West graduates, uh, one who just graduated from no Notre Dame and the other one's still at Notre Dame. Yeah. Very impressive young man and we look forward to introducing this concept in greater detail. Uh, moving forward, but certainly with the bus company because they would have to you know, play a role and to see if they have the existing technology, and if not, you know, to, to what extent could they add it? And would that cost be uh, pushed on to us? So it is a good conversation to have. Yeah, well, thank you for bringing that up. If they want our business, <laughs> they'll have to do it because Kids Face, he comes first all the time. Thank you. Any other items for new business? Uh, thank you. The, the resolutions map, the NISBA resolutions? Yeah. Weren't they under new business? They are. I'm, did you want to bring them up? Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. We, we need to discuss whether or not we're, we, we want to support them and if we want to join uh, the other Nassau Suffolk boards in sending our agreement with the resolutions or disagreement up to the state. Would you like to introduce some of the resolutions to the community? Uh, let's see, Proposition 1 has to do with the reserve fund amendments to eliminate the use of short-term borrowing. Proposition 2, special education advocacy oversight. Proposition 3, uh, local control. Proposition 4, parental rights. Proposition 5, religious exemption. Proposition 6, single occupancy zoning. Proposition 7, sex education. Just so, to be clear to the public, I, I think these are propositions that were, that you're proposing to send to NISBA to be voted on potentially. NISBA would then potentially accept these as propositions that would be added to a list that would be voted on at their uh, annual meeting. Correct. The same, okay. you know, like the propositions, you know, you did the tally sheets last year. Yep. Yes. But these are and propositions so that have been developed by a, a These were developed a with the Ford coalition. coalition. Okay. And the, 
Uh, what, what coalition? The Nassau the, Suffolk School Board Coalition that we talked to you guys about. They have the meetings once a month. Okay. Yeah, month. would you and be able just to describe to the community what this coalition consists of? Because you, you've explained it to us, but you know, we're having a public discussion and we want the community to know what we're talking about. So would you be able to explain what this coalition is and, and who is involved? Um, so Thank you. Uh, it's just it's a group of um, school boards who they have one or two um, representatives from each board that want to work together. Um, that feel that there's strength in numbers and when we can agree on, you know, things like this that we want to go forward and, you know, have districts together saying, I'll give, throw a number out there, 20 of us, um, you know, believe these same things and would like you to support these same things when it comes to NISBA, um, that, you know, we feel like it'd be more um, advantageous that NISBA sees, oh, wow, 20 districts from Long Island all want the same things, let's take a look at it. Um, instead of just one random district from Long Island coming up with a proposition that maybe NISBA doesn't realize that there's a lot of other districts that feel the same way. Um, so John, Karen, and I have gone to meetings before. They've had them for the past year. It just enables everyone to kind of meet each other and to understand what's going on in different districts, to bounce ideas off each other, to learn about what other districts are doing. And it's a really nice setting that I would really encourage you guys all. I mean, it's kind of annoying because a lot of meetings are in Nassau County, but. Whatever, if you rotate it, it doesn't seem that bad. They give you cookies, too. So uh, you have a little incentive to get there. Um, but that's what the Nassau Suffolk School Board Coalition is. And so like I said, we've been going. And they, um, we did not come up with any of these resolutions ourselves. These are resolutions that the other um, school boards came up with. And it was their suggestion, the um, people who run the committee, that they want you know, other school boards to vote on it. And they've been asking us, could you please bring it back to your school board and vote on it before the end of June so that they can, you know, meet all the dates and the timelines set forth by NISBA for resolutions to be adopted. So even if we voted on this, um, it's obviously not a definite that NISBA is going to adopt any of these. You know, we had just thought that if we agree with them and so do 15 other, 30 other districts that NISBA would listen a little more knowing that there's more people that feel or more boards that feel the same way. Now, is this, is this a request to vote on all seven? No, of they're separate. You don't have to. They, basically, they're just asking if, you want, if you're in agreement with all seven, then they would, I guess, note that it was all seven. What, however they submit things to NISBA, I guess they would show it to us to show that our school district's name on it, or Smithtown's in favor of one, three, and five, and then if the district who wrote number six wants to go ahead and do it on their own because nobody else votes to go with them, then they could do it on their own, I guess. It just wouldn't be with anybody else's, you know, name on it. Right. So, you know, just for instance, like one proposition one to me seems like a no-brainer, but I would need to hear I feel I would need to hear from Andrew and yeah, Andrew's right. position on that. So, is this something that we can Well, we have until the 28th. That's why we wanted it to happen now cuz we figured exactly like what you said, people are going to read it, they're going to have questions. To me it seems like a no-brainer too, but I I mean, so did that's what every other school board said when they talked to their um, I think that you know, just and only only Suffolk does. This is something that, that with Tans, this is something that I know uh, Mr. Tobin and I have spoke to spoke about several times years ago, and um, I you know even brought it to um, you know Suffolk County Comptroller a few years ago about how we can really do away with the, the Suffolk County districts that have to borrow in the beginning of the school year so that we can fund the the payroll right from the start of the year. There's all different types of, of and this is coming from the, the county controller, there's all different types of things that would have to be changed as far as when the, the towns and county collects taxes and when they were, would right, be able right. to get that money to the districts. So that would be something I could yeah, definitely support, but also would look to have conversations with other people to get more information about the realistic possibility of something like this. Well, again, these and, are and just, the that you know, but to I say just, to NISBA, hey, would you, yeah. would so, you read them? Would you think about for, it? For those that haven't been to, I've been to a couple of the, you know, state conferences on it. When you go and there's a voting session on the last day, everybody has a representation from their district. These protocols or these, uh, you know, propositions, it's well, it's part of their agenda, and it will list all the school districts. Sometimes it, you know, Syosset School District put it up, or yeah. New York City, and our name would be included with any ones that Correct. we all agree right. by a, uh, a majority. Right, exactly. That's okay. what they're saying. They're just thinking their strength in numbers, and if 15 districts agree on the same thing, why wouldn't we all do it together? That's their point. Yeah. So. Can I just clarify the, 
the, the one concerning the TANS resolution is school districts aren't currently allowed to borrow from our reserves, short-term borrow from our reserves to help pay in lieu of borrowing to pay Correct. for those. This would allow us to do that. Correct. So to my, there's no problem with it on its surface. It still may not completely eliminate the need if we don't have that much reserves to borrow against, right. but it's a, on its surface, I don't see any problem with it. It would allow, it, the TANS process would still, or the tax collecting process would still continue, but it would allow us to borrow from ourselves, which we currently can't do for whatever reason by law, to, to p help pay for that borrowing. That's the okay. gist. In, in terms of number two for special education oversight, I certainly don't disagree that sometimes the advocates that may come to represent parent aren't really doing what's in the best interest of kids. Uh, and sometimes their behaviors can be less than uh, appropriate. But I don't, I don't know if, if a proposition could, like in theory, I, I, I like it, but I don't know if we could put a resolution of who can go and represent a parent at a CSE meeting. You know, so I mean, I think federal law would overtake that in terms of not being, you know, a parent could bring anybody they would like to represent them I at a meeting. I think this was supposed to be in, oh, you don't mean a parent bringing someone to sit next to them, you mean in place of the parent. Well, like, again, if I wanted, if I had a meeting for my son and I wanted to bring you with me, you know, the committee couldn't tell me yeah. that no, I could. I think this is referring to in place of the parent, like when the, if there's no parent that's coming. Well, there there is no required parent member right now on a CSE. Back, it used to be where a parent member was required, and you would waive the parent right. uh, person. Now it's the opposite, where you're requesting a parent member because they just weren't able to have enough parent members at it. Right, so right, this. Yeah. This, the way that I read it, and I could be misreading it, is sometimes that there's people out there that are advocates for families that don't necessarily have the background or the knowledge or experience and come in and, and don't really push what's best for kids. They're pushing their own personal agenda, exactly. which I, I've run into that, but I don't know if we could tell a parent that they couldn't have somebody specific Again, you know, I there. think it's not the parent bringing someone, it's in place of the parent that the, whoever serves as the advocate in place of the parent would have to go through some sort of, I don't know, for lack of a better word, our training or something to understand what exactly you're doing as that advocate. So if you're a parent member or you're requesting, they do go through training. I, I think we could speak to Dan a little bit about that. Uh, yes, they do go through, through training to be a parent member. Um, I have to dive into this, but the way I read it as yeah. well is more of an advocate Yes, exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's yeah, which is different member. than a parent member. Right, exactly. So a parent advocate would be someone that the parent brings to a CSE meeting. Currently, a parent can bring anyone they would like to so a CSE meeting. So maybe we should go back to them because that's not when we sat at the meeting, which is why it's good to just sit there and listen instead of just reading it. The way they explained it, what it was not an advocate. It was not a, me bringing her to the meeting to help me or to advocate for me while I sit there. It was in place of me so that you know somebody would have training. And I guess district appointed. Right. Advocate. Yeah, a district appointed advocate. And they were saying that that I get you know, because yeah, this I think is for the, the state. I, this is not just for one little town. So when we're maybe we do it that way and we require, you know, trainings, but maybe it's not done no, everywhere. Any any parent that's going to be the parent member of a CSE has to go through right. training first right. and a parent can request that person to be okay, at the Okay, so meeting. let me find out what okay. exactly because the way I understood it, it was not the parent member, because I know what those are, okay. and it was not an advocate, like, come with me, friend. The way it that was, I read it as parent advocates yeah. is, is okay. somebody that they're right. selected. Yeah, no, I... I is, is this something that needs to be discussed in public when we're talking about these resolutions? Because, Probably not. Right. Cause the only reason I say that is because if we're going to put this on for the 28th, I, I, I want to be able to have these discussions prior to the 28th and not... <clears throat> you know. we, where, when are we going to do that? We're gonna yeah, I'd also like to talk to, you know, some other like Dr. Secor and, and Cabinet, and, and also some other people, and um, just to get some different idea, you know, the meaning of, of some of these different resolutions. Because you know, at looking at some of them just on the surface, some of them look like no-brainers, but you know, some of them, you know, there's a lot to be answered. You know, wow. some some of the words that are in there can be tricky and. and I would like to bring the religious you know, so, exemption back. So throwing kids out of school because they don't have a shot is 
certainly not something fun for any principal, school nurse, or administrator. Yeah. What did so you say, sorry? I, I said I'd like to bring back the religious exemption back. Mm. You know. Well, that's, that's yep. in there. I, oh. That's what I'm saying. No, I, I read through it, but maybe we could set something up, uh, maybe a virtual conversation uh, in the next session discuss yeah, these, like but idea. I did read them all. There are some things that I agree with, others I have some questions. Yep. That's yeah, Sounds good. That I just can't agree with the way that they're drafted, but yeah. maybe if they're changed or... Yeah, the, I think this was just, because like, we had, they were like little mini bullets almost, and I had said, that's not going to work. I, I felt like you guys are going to want an actual resolution, so we said to them, can you please write up the actual resolution. So or that's the what they are, the way it's going to be. So because I, I thought, how are we going to vote on something where you're like, well, I don't really know if that's the wording. Right. So we asked them to please write it up as, and then we could go back and Steve, forth. if we but. can also give you a copy of this, you, if you could look it over and just send an email back to the board and Dr. Secor and just in terms of where there's landmines, you know, and where there's overreach, like there was, you know, when you're talking about educational program, I mean, that's going to come from the department. But if you can guide us to make sure that we're staying in our lane, uh, but there are a couple things that I would be happy to, to say yes to and, and to approve. Um, Karen, would you be able to send those to Mr. Goodstat? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Oh, you did? All right, great. Awesome. Excellent. Any other items for new business? Great. Oh, no, I did, sorry. Um, the grading thing, I just, it's actually, I don't even know if you guys can answer it, but um, if you could just have it for next time. Um, I'm just wondering, and thank you for sending me that policy, Dr. Secor, but um, do we, ha what is the district philosophy on not ranking? I'm just, I don't know, and not having balance out. I'm just wondering why we don't do it. Because the policy states we don't, and I'm just wondering what the philosophy was whenever that was done way back when, or. Sure. That goes back to 2010. No, oh, so it's not that okay. long ago. Um, well, and I guess it actually just at the, at the time, um, the grade point average GPA was used to determine the rank uh, in class. Alpha grades are assigned quality points, which are used to co uh, to compute GPA. Grades earned in advanced placement courses are weighted with an additional 1.0 quality point. And the student must sit for the AP exam in order to uh, receive a weighted grade. Yeah. Back at the time, because we were in an alpha system, the basic sentiments that were there was the fact that students who were receiving an A minus would end up having um, a little bit of a, a challenge when it came to the college admission process because if you took a look at someone who came in with a high class rank or if you had a student who came in even with an A minus uh, and a high uh, SAT score, that there was a concern that the colleges were not looking at them uh, to the best of their ability uh, and it was not favoring our students itself. This at the time really stemmed um, from uh, private schools at the time, um, and we wanted to make sure we were putting our students into the best light as possible. A uh, committee was formed, um, and what the outcome of that was really taking a look at rigor versus rank. What are the colleges looking for? And the colleges are really looking to have that rigor aspect, and when you had rank sometimes back then, colleges would just take a look at the rank and they would start making snap judgments. When you didn't have that ranking aspect, then you had the ability now where you could sit there and they had to take a look at the whole child to really balance rigor. Now here we are 10 years later, we uh, know at this point, colleges basically take our transcripts, they reweight yeah, everything, exactly. and they create their own yep. numerics to be able to determine that. Um, at this point in time, uh, the last time we had taken a look at the data for itself, it was uh, roughly online that 40% of the high schools did not utilize rank any longer. Um, and that's been like a national trend that had been going on over the course uh, of the last decade or so. So that's the, that's the quick version of why that, why that happened going back in 2010. Okay, and why don't we have Val and Sal? Because we don't rank. But what, even, even years ago, that's something that has been a Smithtown um, practice for I mean, many years that we don't do a Val and Sal. Okay. Because there are many districts that don't rank but have Val and Sal anyway, so technically they rank, they just don't go three through the bottom. Um, and I mean, there are some colleges that require your, you know, your ranking, and so do we give it when it's required? There are some applications that do require it. Specifically like the service academies, many yes. times they will ask for something like right. that, uh, and the counselors will do their best to be able to provide them what they can do for those students. It's just not an, it's not an official practice where we rank students, but we're never going to utilize that to harm any student that's there. Right. Okay.
All righty. Any other items for new business? Without any other, Mrs. O'Connor, public participation. The first speaker is Edward Moore. How you doing tonight, Mr. Moore? Good. You know what I enjoyed? That electromechanical group. Pretty cool, right? Oh, that's, you know, that almost brought tears to my eyes because, you know, I've created from that, that field. You know, and to, to see that at a, at a, a school, you know, high school level, and this, because those guys, with that, that's the key. If you can actually do that, and then I'm hearing they're doing it, I hope this don't count. But I, <laughs> my three minutes. But to see that and have that after school curricular activity to do that, because the technology is the key. If we can inspire it and they can get a taste of that, oh, then you inspire. Otherwise, everything is just words, you know? That's exactly what we're doing. Well, and I, like I said, when I seen that, that made me happy. That really did. You know, I love I love learning. I love education. I do it all the time. You know, I just love to learn. Mr. Moore, and, can you just pick up your microphone just oh, so we can hear you a little bit better? I'm sorry. Yeah. There you go. I, just, I love to learn. You know, I love education, and I and I do it all my life. I had to learn the technology when I couldn't get a job after the service. You know, I had to start my own business, and I had to learn. And I was fortunate to have a mentor, a, a job. The guy said, you know, Ed. You know, this don't work, fix this. Ed, I need this, but I want you to do it. I want you to do it. And I had to learn. And if you learn how to learn, that's the key. If you can teach your students to learn without all the nonsense in between, meaning they have to tell them how to learn, but if they can learn to be, learn for themselves, and then you find that dream, you get, teach them how to learn, that's it. And today, with the internet and all the information, well, anyway, so I'll leave that. Now I'll go back to my three minutes here. Yeah. I got that, my letter here. I'll give it to you. Ah, I'm waking up again. Thank you. Had to give me a chance to wake up. Now, the superintendent spoke in reference to security. That's my field. I've been in the security field for over 40, even more than 40 years. Integrating security, cameras protecting the homes. And I'm fortunate that I have accounts today on Long Island. I did the who's who of Lloyd Neck, Jericho Terrorist, major uh, project. I got a project down the camera line as I'm working out. And what I see here today, what concerns me is, and thank you for your information about your security system, but from what I understand, what I heard, is you have the, you have the surveillance, you have, and then you have your access control system. You have the ability to integrate all of that. Now, according to an FBI report over here, you got five minutes. You got five minutes before these guys come in there and start shooting your children. Okay, now the whole key to that is, well, how can we stop that? They have now the analytics and the AI that you can actually use and put onto your surveillance system, which means you take this, you have all the information feeds from all your camera systems, okay, and you have access to control. I heard about that. Now, you take all the information that you're getting from your surveillance, you run it through a server that has the analytics and the, and the AI in it, and they have the ability now to detect guns. You actually can take a gun. There's a SEAL team guys, four SEAL team guys. I forgot what SEAL team number it is. They say started in 2018. Okay, they went to the Wharton School of Business. There's four teams. These guys are sharp military guys. So they learned it. They realized that they learned all, and they got, and with AI, you have to learn it. 
I learned in systems. I only learned a system in a month ago at a person's home. What do you mean by that, Ed? Well, you have residential systems over here. So you, when you put in a security system, of course, you have all these homes. It's just common sense. You have a home, you put a perimeter around there, and if you can extend the perimeter around your home, what do, what do the people want? Ed, I want cameras. I want cameras out there. I want to point it on my lawn, and if anybody walks on my lawn, I want to be detected. Can you do that? Yes. You can put trip wires over there. You can actually put things. to have object video. You have the technology. Now, you have three of the best companies in the country over here. Here. One is called Omni Alert. One is called Zero Alert and one's called the, uh, Eagle Eyes. Okay, what, I'm, now that, what they have the ability to do, they have the analytics, you put it in there, you input it into your system. I spoke to them, I got a report here, I'm gonna give it to you. You have the opportunity for these guys to come here, sit behind, I've seen how you do it your, with your board, you put five, six people, I can get the top people, put them right in front of you, I'm gonna give you information over here, you can talk to your security people over here, what you got over here, and say these are the guys we wanna to talk to, you put them in front of you, ask the questions, and they'll look at your system and they can approve it. Although you only got five minutes, you gotta detect them outside. You don't want them to get in here. Once they're in here, you're screwed. You can put all your money you want over here and put all your life. And then the other thing I'm hearing, you can access, you can integrate your access control system with your surveillance system, you know, with that, and, that, and your mass notification system. Okay, because the other thing is what you don't want these clowns to do, which they will do, they'll come in here and they'll blow off something over here, have your guys run out the door, and they'll be sitting over there in the woods over there shooting your kids down. You got to have your eyes and you got to know what you're doing. Mr. And Moore, then you can, all right, anyway, is your so, information in here? Is that information in this packet? Oh, I got that here. Because I know you're getting past that three minutes, so. Okay, all right, all right good, but thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, wait, now, what, the, what did you read the letter, what it says? You just handed it to us. Yeah, I know, I know. just, just read, the last, what you were read the last paragraph, if you don't mind. Just read the last paragraph, what does it say? Oh, boy. Thank you very much. Okay, well, well, okay, I'll explain what it says. Basically, I'm requesting you to put on the agenda, okay, a, a, a date where I can invite these people to actually uh, before. Mr. Moore, yes, give, if, I, if you can give uh, the superintendent a call and uh, discuss. Well, I'm, wait, 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 hold on. No, no, that's, You're the school board. Wait no, a that's not how this works, I, I though. Say, what's that? That's not how this works. I mean, you can, you, I can't. This, this is how it works. According to Eagle, uh, Zero Eye, they approached the school board, got the approval. Okay, and the reason I'm putting it to the school, uh, he's one man, I understand that. You got a school board. I'm, I'm going to give you the information, you look at the information, and then you vote on whether I'm going to be able to, to yeah, have no, invite it them. It doesn't really work that way. The superintendent and his, his administration go through the process and they make a recommendation, which then the school board well, votes on. Well, what, well, what are you guys there for? We're oversight. Right. Well, I'm going to, the whole idea is I want to give you, inf you're the guy, don't you get it? I'm going to give you information. You're going to, I want you to look at I, it. I understand that. Mr. And then I, I want you to see, and then I want you to approve of me, a, but it's a just, time for these people to come here. And then you, you, well, I, otherwise, otherwise you guys are useless, you're uh, telling me we'll, now. We'll, we'll check it out and then Dr. Secor, if you could look into it and then. Uh, We'll have them reach out well, to you. I'm gonna, so, I'm gonna give you the information. You, I'm gonna make sure they have it there. You got some members of your school board, thank and then you, I Moore. want you to discuss it, okay? Can you discuss it? Mr. Moore, this is public participation, which you're well past your, your time. We have other people that signed up to speak. Oh yeah, okay. I'll tell you this. Something happened to these kids over here. Okay, you're gonna eat it, not me, buddy. You know, we'll, we'll look it over. We'll Mr. look it Moore. over and we'll give it to Dr. Sukor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Security is always part of our conversations. Security has been a major part of our conversations. All right, Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. Guys, guys, easy, 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 easy. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Yeah, you can leave it on the table, please, sir. Thank you. Mrs. O'Connor, who do we have next? Very. Okay. I'm still feeling the pain of those kids. Okay? Make sense? You should be emotional about it. If you're not, something's wrong with you. Mr. Moore, I've had several conversations with my nine-year-old about why and what we could do to protect this stuff. So, yeah. I get that. But also, but also from, from talking to 
a child and what they see and, and the, what they're feeling and, and the confusion and the fear. So we're having those conversations and we're making sure that we protect every child. We've been saying this for years and it's, it's real that our priority is to have a healthy and safe educational program, the best possible, whether the threats are, whether the threats are seen or unseen. Okay? Thank you, Mr. Mr. Moore, we do, we do have a security Mr. front Moore, that we, we appreciate your concern. They make recommendations for us. We do appreciate you bringing We other do appreciate your concern, and, Thank you. and we, we will look at it. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Mrs. O'Connor. The next speaker is Mike Simonelli. Good evening. Good evening. How you doing? Doing all right. Yourself? All right. Pretty good. Hi, I'm Mike Simonelli. And in response to my speech last month criticizing the district for promoting gender sexuality concepts, placing feelings over facts, Dr. Sikor and four board members released a political letter stating it's your legal and moral obligation to protect our children. So regarding that obligation, I'm advising that your actions in affirming pronouns contrary to our children's biological reality is enabling those that are LGB or gender nonconforming on a path to serious mental and physical harm. Pronoun rituals are extremely effective at normalizing the abolition of biological sex in favor of gender identity. These rituals take advantage of people's compassion to achieve compliance. Far from compassionate, supporting these rituals put our children on the pipeline from school to sterilization. There's two stages of gender transition. The first is social transition and includes changing one's name and pronouns. The second is medical transition and includes hormone therapy and surgeries. Removing the breast and a hysterectomy or removing the testes and it's inverting the penis to create a vagina. Puberty blockers in these surgeries result in permanent infertility 100% of the time. A long-term study found transgender medical treatment shortens the patient's life by 50%. Other side effects include cancer, stroke, tumors, and bone density loss. The suicide rate among those who had reassignment surgery is 20 times higher than the rate among non-transgender. Now, 10 years ago, this wasn't an issue in schools because traditionally the majority of transsexuals were adult males, but something's changed. While there were hardly any scientific literature before 2012 on girls aged 11 to 21 ever having developed gender dysphoria, now over 80% of the youths identifying as having gender dysphoria are female. This new phenomenon is called rapid onset gender dysphoria and it's led to concerns there's a social contagion taking place among girls, much like the self-harm and eating disorders more prevalent amongst them. Many of those affected suffer from anxiety, ADHD, autism spectrum traits, and depression. John Hopkins Professor of Psychiatry, Dr. McHugh, said gender dysphoria is a mental disorder and policymakers are doing no favors to our self-identifying children by treating their confusion as a right in need of defending rather than a mental disorder that deserves understanding, treatment, and prevention. It's a disorder similar to a dangerously thin female suffering anorexia who looks in the mirror and thinks they're overweight. Studies show 70 to 80 percent of kids expressing transgender feelings spontaneously lose those feelings over time. Here's what one young woman wrote about being led down the transgender path. When I was 12, I found on the internet that young girls could be trans, and it would solve why I hated myself so much, why my life was so horrible. I'm going to tell you from experience, the coddling of transgender people and their delusions, you're going against fundamentals of nature and damaging yourself. No such thing as sex change, only sterilization. People won't want to date you, your health declines, your body suffers, your social life suffers. So please ask yourselves, how exactly are you protecting our children by affirming them along the path to hormone therapies or gender reassignment surgeries that many of them will regret for the rest of their shortened lives? Thank you. You know, Mr. Simonelli, I, I, there's a lot of things that I understand that I don't understand. But what I do understand is when we're told that LGBTQ, LGBTQ youth are at a 40% higher risk of suicide, which I, I couldn't even imagine being in that position, whether it be as a person contemplating that or a parent. Right. If there's anything that we can do to help save somebody's life, we'll do that. And well, if, if it's something as simple as acknowledging how somebody is, great. If that's going to make somebody feel accepted so that they're 
not going to commit suicide like we've spoken about several times, that's the least we can do as we speak about trying to create connections with every student in our district. So that's what I'm trying to tell you is the compassion. Okay. You're trying to be affirming. Obviously, we're not. I, I, and the affirming is taking people from okay, the I, social transition to the medical transition, which they end they regret later. Again, there's things the ones that, that had gender dysphoria, okay. the rapid onset. There's kids that start from very little, and they have it. That's a whole different story. Okay, I'm not Simonelli, talking about your, that. Your time is over. Does anybody else want to add anything? Mr. Simonelli, those are issues that we leave to the medical community. It's not for us to make those decisions. The only thing we're here for is to make sure that our children, every single one of them, feels welcome when they walk in the door and feels a sense of belonging. And that's what our ob obligation is here as Board of Education members. And as long as I'm on the Board of Education, I will continue to make sure that we do our best to, to ensure that our children feel welcome when they walk in the door. And if that's calling them by a different name or, or accepting their identity for the time being, absolutely, that's what we need to do to make sure that those children live and survive the high school years. Uh, and that's what's most important to me. Yeah, and that's a whole different story than telling other children to say bi biologically and genetically incorrect pronouns. I'm not saying to treat the right, kids right. any way differently. Yeah. When you're dealing with we, that. We're not well, really having a discussion right now. This is, this is public participation. We have three minutes. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, folks, he had his time. Just like anybody else would have their time, let, let's keep the comments. Thank you. The next Ms. speaker is Rob Stretchmeyer. Have a good night, Mr. Moore. How are you doing tonight, Mr. Stretchmeyer? I'm doing okay, thank you. I just want to gather my thoughts. I don't want to take any more of your time. Um, my name is Robert Stretchmeyer, and I'm a physical education teacher here in the Smithtown School District. For the past 23 years, as well as a coach for the past 18 consecutive years at all levels throughout the district, I'm here tonight to discuss um, my head coaching position for the varsity girls soccer program at Smithtown West, a position I held in the highest esteem for the past 13 consecutive years, uh, a position that also brought me to where I currently teach today, which is at a Comset Middle School. Um, where do I begin? I I, I kind of. I know that, um, and with respect to the administrators I had spoke to about this, uh, and then listening to what the board's role is in, in oversight, um, I just feel compelled to come here tonight and to really speak for myself and, and some of the, the narrative that's kind of going around, um, around this position uh, in terms of um, how really I've been uh, offered the position and then that's since been rescinded um, because of some um, things that have transpired. Um, with my position. Um, so I'll, I'll start ba basically where that began. Um, during the COVID year, um, I, I lost my father. Um, it was a difficult time. Um, I didn't feel, well, I lost him January 31st. As you know, the fall sports season was pushed into the spring. Um, so the timing of losing my father and being able to um, deal with some of those things was, was difficult. Uh, in the short time the season was pushed into the spring um, and the small window of sort of finding someone to fill that position in a short amount of time, I just felt the responsibility to put, put those things aside and uh, be there for the kids in that, that spring season. I did that. Um, I didn't have my assistant that I had for 10 years because his position consequently was grieved out. So I had a, a first year teacher that was in there. Um, didn't. Um, she did a, a fine job, but she didn't really provide the support that I needed. It was a difficult year. We got through it. Um, that brought us into um, almost the exact day we're in now, um, which was last year, where when we finished the season, I realized I need, needed to take the time I needed um, for my family. Um, when I um, expressed that to my athletic director, he understood. Uh, he gave me the grace I needed um, to take the time I needed which was the fall season. Um, the turnaround from that spring COVID year into the fall was only a few months. It was just not enough time for me to, to kind of do what I needed. Uh, Mr. Savaretti, I, um, 
I listened to what you said, and my story is certainly different than yours in terms of what I was going through, but um, I took my situation and uh, I spoke to my athletic director. The next thing I did was I thought it was appropriate to speak to my captains and kind of get a feel of where they were. Uh, I sat in front of these girls and I, I tried to convince myself, well, maybe I can do this. And um, much like yourself, I didn't think it was appropriate to put that raw emotion in front of kids. It just, it didn't feel right. So uh, for the first time in 18 years, I, I thought maybe I should put myself first here for once. Hi, Mr. Stretchman, you're getting a little bit past that three minutes if you want to just finish okay. up. Thank you. Fair enough. I just, I'm here tonight because some of the narrative out there is that maybe that's untrue on why I took the break. I was offered the break by Pat Smith. I accepted it. Um, the next day I went and spoke to my, my team about it. Everyone was aware. The following day I sat with the two coaches that sat in the position and I had the same speech that I had with my athletic director and I did with my captains. Everybody was on the same page that I was taking a leave for the year. When the fall season uh, came about the next year and it was over, Pat Smith called me and he offered me the position back. I accepted. Um, the coaches were made aware. Three months, three and a half months went by and then I got a call um, basically saying that the job was no longer mine. Um, and that's kind of where, where I'm at with this. Um, to be offered a position and with my standing in the community and my reputation, um, I kind of do what I say, say what I'm going to do. And if, if I say I'm coming back and, and I put it out into the community, um, to have that kind of rescinded from me kind of took away some of that credibility I had in, in, to do with my reputation. Sir, I'm going to ask you to finish up, please. Thank you. Very good. It's, it's hard to, to wrap it all up. I did send you a letter. Um, I did get a, a reply from some of you. Most of what I said tonight is in that letter yep. amongst some context. But in the end, um, I, just, I just feel like uh, there's, there's maybe more to this that you should know, maybe speaking to some of the integrity of some involved. I brought nothing but integrity to my position for the past 13 years. And I just feel like perhaps maybe I'm owed a little grace for that. Um, that's really all I have. Thank you I'm for your time. Sorry for your loss, and, and thank you for sharing your, your story. I know, I, you know what, I'm not going to take any more of your time. I know you've given enough. Uh, I just, I don't know if that came out right, but I, I really felt compelled to come tonight. I know there's a lot of support for me in this. Um, it's very difficult for some of the people that support this to come up and speak. So I'm here doing that. Um, with that said, I fully respect um, everybody that's up here and doing what they need to do. Um, but, but quite honestly, the, I hope when it has to come to an outcome or a solution to this, that uh, you, can, you can see that uh, I'm still willing to be here. Well, thank right. you very much, sir. Thank you. I, I know that I don't know you personally. I, I do know of your reputation, and just I want to thank you for all that you've done for our kids and our program, and I understand it's a very difficult situation that we really can't speak about here in a public session, but I want to thank you for all the work that you do for your kids, for our kids, and your dedication and your stellar reputation. I uh, think so. You. The next speaker is Kristen Robinson. How are you doing tonight? I'm, I'm hot. It is hot in here. We definitely do need air conditioning. <laughs> um, so uh, tonight I wanted to talk about, um, I wanted to thank you for talking about the security, the physical safety of our children in light of the school shootings um, is very important. Um, thank you for talking about the suicide rate in the LGBTQ community because that is also very important, the safety of our children's mental health. Um, I'm concerned about the growing racism and homophobia in our community. Um, I, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't hear of an incident happening at one of the schools in our community. We've had um, parents get up here and talk about their daughter being called the N-word 12 times in one month. Or, um, you know, it, we're making national news. There's a news article about a student who is a thespian and, you know, was bullied and um, it led to litigation. Um, I suggest that we have a, you know, there's, you know, the, um, the theory, the tipping point, 
where you know eventually a trend or social behavior crosses the threshold, tips and spreads like wildfire. This is what is happening. We're watching it in real time on TV while we're watching it in our community. Um, without clear boundaries and consequences, issues will keep happening and they will grow like wildfire. Um, when do we say that a racial slur or homophobic slur becomes um, hate speech? Is it when one student says it? Is it when two students? Is it when 20 students gang up on another student? We have to draw the line, and I think we should really adopt a zero tolerance policy, especially in um, high school, about using those those terms. I think that we should have an you know um, an honor code or something that you sign at the beginning of the year, and you know the exact consequences for your actions. I'm not talking about elementary school; kids are still learning. I'm not talking about middle school. I'm talking about high school. I'm also talking about this forum. We can't let people who aren't medical professionals speak degradingly about people in our community. It's, it's not okay, and this is live. People are watching it, and it's harmful and dangerous. And I think that's all I had to say tonight, um, except I do agree with Karen and Stacy about the um, interim between when we get the air conditioners. We just need something to solve the problem, either like, I don't know, more fans or something, but cut the school day short, like if it's going to be over a certain temperature, it's just it's too much. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and concerns. Appreciate it. Yes, Dr. Secor. Yeah, I would like to comment on the, the, the piece uh, you mentioned related to, you know, racism, homophobia. We do have clear boundaries and consequences, and, and they're outlined in the Dignity for All Students Act, and we certainly need to address them when they come up. And, we're, you know, we're morally and legally bound to do just that. So we certainly do, you know, hold students accountable when they make poor choices. You know, and every situation is different, but we are duty bound to hold students accountable when they make those choices. Not only to, to understand that there are consequences, but there's also learning to be had. You know, and that work will never be enough because these things still happen. And you said it, it's happening in real time in many forums, in many places, certainly not just Smithtown, but we are certainly very cognizant of our responsibility and certainly ready, willing, and able to stand up to that responsibility. Mrs. O'Connor? Next speaker is Jacqueline Rooney. How are you doing tonight? Good evening. Still here? Yes, last time I had to leave. In the future, maybe we can do the community speaking first and letting you know about our concerns rather than us sitting by and listening to you guys, you know, argue things that you can argue behind closed doors. Um, the first thing I want to say, I was here to speak about school safety, but after that disgusting little speech that we just had to listen to, I think we need to once I need my Smithtown students, if you're looking and you're watching, if you see this later, people do not think like that. You have allies, you have parents in this community that love you, that are standing by you, and people like the one we just heard are in the minority. I just want you to know that. Because a child is gonna listen to that and, whole, and completely feel worse than they probably already do with a world that, you know, hurts them more than we should. Um, on that note, I recently emailed all of you requesting that you revisit the Smithtown School Safety Plan so that it includes different measures that may secure the internal safety of Smithtown schools. I thank the board members who responded to me regarding the matter, as well as Dr. Simmons, for listening to all of my concerns. My hope was that it might at least begin a dialogue on the matter. As I mentioned in my letter, 
Requiring that all classroom doors remain closed and locked throughout the school day has made all the difference in the past as to who survived the school shooting and who didn't. Smithtown School Safety Plan currently mentions nothing about closed and locked doors. Well, locked doors, but not closed doors. I expressed in my letter the failure by many schools where mass shootings had taken place to administer their lockdown drill and alert the school that a gunman was in the building and how it left little time for teachers to try to close the door before he approached their classroom. I've read reports of every school mass shooting that has taken place in this country, and the simple act of keeping interior doors closed and locked was what kept people alive. Yesterday, another school shooting took place at a summer camp in Duncanville, Texas. Thankfully, no one was harmed and the police were able to kill the gunman. The police also reported, however, that the gunman attempted to enter a classroom with kids inside, but that door was locked. That locked door saved lives. We can try to secure the entry into all of our buildings as much as we can, put cameras everywhere we can, get more security, but if God forbid a gunman finds a way into the building, there should be a second line of defense protecting our children. The reason I was given for why keeping doors closed was a difficult, difficult task was the rising temperature of classrooms in the warm months of the school year. As a teacher myself, I definitely understand what that's like, but we're living in a different time where real threats exist and I would choose the heat for a couple of months a year over placing myself and the children I serve in harm's way. And if the heat is such a concern, maybe this community needs to step up and try to get central air into, into the Smithtown schools. I know the amount of money it will cost, but likely, I already mentioned in all, to all of you, that what price do we have to place on the safety and protection of our children? I think from what we've witnessed in all the school shootings that have happened, the mass murder of innocent children is an impossible way to bear. And could we truly look ourselves in the mirror and honestly say we did everything we could to make sure our kids were safe. Mrs. Rooney, you're getting a little bit past that three minutes if you want to finish up. Um, Mr. Over there had 10 minutes. Can I just read one more thing? Please. I asked again, I will ask you again, that you consider reevaluating Smithtown School Safety Plan and take this one request seriously to minimize the potential threat that now exists in our nation's schools. It is our job as the adults to protect our children, and by not taking the basic precaution seriously, I would say without a doubt that we would have failed immeasurably. Thanks. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, we are constantly uh, evaluating, reevaluating the district safety plan for threats both seen and unseen. And I know that it's um, something with Dr. Secord presented before about upgrades that we're, we're making now as a recommendation from our security. And um, we'll continue to have, always have those conversations on how we can uh, improve to deal with uh, threats that are, are possibilities. and. Um, We'll take the recommendations from the professionals that we have here. Um, you know, can I just comment on something that you said about, um, is, it has nothing to do with school safety, but um, can we maybe in the beginning of each meeting read what the items that can be discussed behind closed doors in executive session are so that the community is reminded? Because sometimes it's, if you're not in it and you don't know what it is, they it, people might not realize what we're allowed to discuss behind closed doors and that some things we're not allowed to discuss behind closed doors, and we do have to talk about it out here, whether there's disagreements or not. So maybe we could add that in the beginning. Is it too long to yeah, read? Yeah, well, we and usually say that at the beginning when we first go into executive session, we tell the, you, reasons, you, the reasons right. that why we're going into executive session. But I mean session. to tell everybody reason what we're allowed to talk about in executive session. Like, you give the reasons as to why we're going there, but there are certain topics that have to be spoken about there, and everything else must be done in public. So maybe, you know, just educating everyone there, so they understand. There are things, it is on the agenda, as Mrs. O'Connor said, but there's also things that. On every agenda, maybe if you could state that session, perfect. it leaves, it gives all of the reasons one through 10. It's okay. in the public content. If you click on adjourn to exec session, it lists all of that and the reasons why you can. Well, I know well, that. I'm just saying the community yeah, would need to know that. I'm, I'm telling you, it's on the public agenda yes, every I, under. But at yes, the same time, yeah, when you have people the community could yeah, that are willing that. to work in good faith together, that a lot of these discussions are handled outside. And so just putting that out there also. Uh, without any further business, oh, we have one more. Excuse me, Mrs. I'm sorry. 
Um, Marie Gurgente, I'm not sure if she's still here. She left. She left. All right, that's it. All right. I want to thank everybody for staying here um, past 11. Appreciate it. And um, hopefully uh, you got some good information from this meeting. With that being said, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Passage unanimously. Have a good night, Smithtown. <laughs>